Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to host this daily conversation that we've had for more than 100 days during the 100 days of lockdown in New York. We're live right now on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Please hit share right now so folks can join us from around the world. Tag your friends right now, please. We'd love to have them join us. We want to do a big shout out to our partnership with Scroll.in. This is one of India's leading independent news, culture, and analysis websites, and they've been simulcasting us for several dozen episodes now, and their audience has therefore become our audience, and we've our reach has increased dramatically. Please keep hitting share right now. Tag a friend. This is our 100th episode. It's Juneteenth. We'll be marking that. As we say on the screen, join us as we learn and mourn and ask questions and celebrate and cry and laugh and so much more. We have at least four awesome guests, but we have actually many, many more. These are just some of our guests. We'll be joined by Professor Nolliway Rooks, the W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of Literature at Cornell. Brandy Harden, lawyer and board member at Justice Aid. We'll be joined a little later by Reverend Kenny Irby, who's at Irby Man. He's a pastor and teacher and a friend for many years. Professor Noliway Rooks, by the way, is on Twitter at nrookie, and you'll see the tweet that lit up the internet today from her. We'll also be joined by Jonathan Borstein, who has watched one, all 99 episodes, and because I know he's watching right now, he's watched 100 episodes of this show. We'll have an extended show today. We're going to 11 p.m. Eastern, and that means we have two hours of content for you, and we've got friends from all over the world who've sent in video greetings, and you'll be able to do the same. So please stand by. We will start in just a minute. Hi, everybody. I'm Sri, and just very grateful to all of you for being here, for being with me on this journey, incredible journey, 100 days. I had no idea when we started we would go even 10 days, let alone 100 days. And this is all possible because of all of you. So many of you have sent in wonderful notes that this is a show that is uplifting. This is a show that's a lifeline. Well, it's uplifting and a lifeline for me. And I'm so grateful that all of you have been with us. We can do this only because of our great viewers and also our sponsors. So we'll go right away and thank our sponsors where we are sponsored by Art & Co. Get involved with the world's largest online art auction, fundraising for COVID-19 victims. Please go to artandco.net, artandco.net and help artists and help victims of COVID-19. This is a big effort that ends next Saturday, not this week, so we have a week to participate. We also want to do a shout out to Rutgers Global Entrepreneurship Experience. This is a virtual teen camp where they can learn, your teens can learn from top entrepreneurs and startup experts from Cognizant, Angie's List, Google, Facebook, among many others. Go to globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org, 20% off code SREE. -E. Please participate. Please tag someone who has a teenager in their life. Meanwhile, don't forget to share this as well. There's so many great speakers and me, so tell your teenager to step away when I'm teaching, but everyone else was there who is fantastic. We also want to tell everybody about this unique opportunity. Muckrack Academy has sponsored us and made it possible for me to give you a free certification course in social media. It's live now, it says June 17th, but it's already live at mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. People have already participated and finished the course. It's a couple of hours and you learn a lot, mrac.co slash social. Here's Lauren Mack's certificate. She's already had it downloaded and she put it on the internet. So everyone, please go to mrac.co slash social. It's open to everyone of any age, any background, any interests and any level of experience, the fundamentals of social media, mrac.co slash social. If you didn't catch any of our promos, 
please let me know, email me, and we will send you information. One last thing, it's Father's Day this weekend, and we have an epic Father's Day show. We start in the morning with Tom Jolly of the New York Times will be here, the print editor, to read the New York Times with me at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. And at 9 p.m. Eastern time, my 17-year-old twins have agreed to be on my show to give us their perspective. And they only agreed to do it because it's Father's Day. Otherwise, they would never come on my show. And we are doing a Father's Day sponsorship opportunity. Thank a father figure in your life. It could be a father, grandfather, uncle, male role model, someone in your family or life. Send in a message and a picture, and we'll read it on the air on both shows. You're seeing here a photo of me with my dad when uh, a few years ago. And on the right, Neil Parekh, executive producer of the New York Times Read Along with his father. So please do let us know. Go to digimentors.link slash Father's Day and Sri at Sri.net if you can't find that. Digimentors.link slash Father's Day. If you can't afford the advertised price, just let us know. Pay what you wish. We definitely want to feature a male role model in your life. We did this for Mother's Day and had 25 people participate. We gave half the proceeds to charity, to Nick Kristoff's initiative around climate change, and we'll be doing a great charity again this year. So we are ready to mark this 100th episode. I first want to bring on our wonderful producers who made this possible for us by being there with us for 99 days. And here they are on day 100. Please say hello to Rose Horowitz. Hi, Hi. Rose. Hi. Great to be here. And here's Vandana Menon. Hi. How are you? Hi. Great to have you both here. And want to say to both of you, thank you for uh, coming on this incredible ride with me and this whole global audience. And part of the reason we can do what we do is because we have incredible support. And my support is actually right here. I want to. I want you all to say hello to my wife, Rupa. Hello. Hi, congratulations. Hi, Rupa. Hi, Rupa. <laughs> We've made it through 100 days, guys. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Very early, you were a guest on a show with Rose, organized a, a wonderful episode about yeah. networking and women, and you were both on it. And uh, uh, you should all know, for those who've been, who watched early episodes and then are wondering, where I am. This is not our apartment. Uh, this lady <laughs> and my twins decided that they're, they're making too much noise in the apartment, too many Zoom calls, too many live shows, not just these, but my WBAI radio show and our other programs for our clients. And so she basically kicked me out. She and the kids <laughs> talked to our friend Rajni, who lives in the building, who's moved to Long Island and said, let him use the apartment or we'll kill him. And then we'll need to use it for the funeral. So instead, I am down here. I need here. it for everyone. So. <laughs> <laughs> but a big shout out to everyone who's watching, who's had family, letting them do something that they wanted to pursue in the middle of all that was going on. I'm so grateful to Rupa and to my kids and to everyone who's let their get our guests come on. You know, we had 200 guests in 99 shows, and that means that many people were the good chance were affected by this as well. So we're very grateful. And uh, thank you so much for letting us do thank what you. we do. Thank <laughs> you for doing this. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, how are you all feeling on, on day 100? I can't believe it's been 100 days. I remember when we were doing this at 50 days and then at 75 days. And it, I can't believe we were, we're at 100. <laughs> yeah. Rose, how are you feeling? I can't believe it's it's been 200 guests. It just doesn't seem possible. <laughs> Let's reveal some of these numbers. We've had 201 guests, including today's guests. 124 of them have been women from 45 cities and 12 countries. And part of this is that we really wanted to make sure we, we, we featured women. We had diverse speakers every single time. And we made that possible because of the both of you working so hard on getting us speakers. What do you think of this card as well, Rose? Uh, well, it's just incredible that it's one million. And I guess if you average it out, it's two guests a show, um, which is incredible. And we, you know, we did work really hard to make sure that we always uh, had women and also that we all, always uh, had a diverse range of speakers from different backgrounds in terms of uh, color, age, everything that we could think of that, that, would include, that was inclusive. Yeah, Vandana, your thoughts? 
Yeah, it's been amazing to meet so many different kinds of people who are doing such different things. And I think that's been one of my biggest takeaways, just learning, meeting and learning from so many incredible people that we've had the opportunity to have on this show. Yeah, and we couldn't have done it without you. I want to show everybody now something else that we're very proud of is that today we're going to encourage people from around the world to watch with us and to also participate. If you'd like to send in a video greeting, as many people have, let me show you how this works. You go onto your computer and go to flipgrid.com slash three show, flipgrid.com slash three show. Let me show it to you again. That's that word flipgrid, flipgrid.com slash three show. And I'm just showing you the QR code. So if you know how to use your QR code reader, you can get here and you can send us a message. And here are messages from people all over the country. And our very, very first video uh, was from Mark Lee. So we're going to just uh, play a little bit of it here now. And we'll watch all of them later. But I'm just going to play it here. I am a big fan of Sri and the work that you've been doing here in digital media. It definitely provided some great conversation on both his daily COVID calls as well as on his Sunday read along of the New York Times. I uh, came across Sri some time back and have been a fan of his for a number of years and definitely think that he is doing some great work revolving around Black Lives Matter, revolving around the economic crisis that we're in, revolving around a number of things that are of importance to us here in the uh, United States, but also around the world. So he is definitely a true voice of the media here in this area. Thank you so much. And that was our friend Mark Lee who joined us. And you can send in your video. You don't have to do it tonight but we will be playing all of them and watching all of them and just being so grateful to all of you for sending in videos. And some of these folks have already sent in videos. Others are sending us comments from around the world. So again, you go to flipgrid.com slash show and you can uh, send in the information or send in the video. But now let's get started. I'm very excited to bring on our guests. So Vandana and, uh, and uh, Rose are going to be backstage tweeting, sharing, et cetera, and they're going to join us again in a little while. We have these two great professors uh, who are joining us uh, in a minute, and they will, will, they'll, be, uh, they'll be with us, our first two guests. And then later on, we also have uh, a couple of other guests joining us. Rose, tell us who you've booked for uh, the 10 o'clock hour. We have Amber, uh, who, has, uh, who is with, uh, who's with uh, Gender Avenger, and uh, she prepared, they, they put up a post, the Gender Avenger of the Week, which they usually do on Fridays. And there it is, uh, where I guess they, they selected all these women, writers, uh, and voices for everybody to celebrate on June, Juneteenth. And we're going to have Amber, uh, who was on our show a few weeks ago with her three, three daughters. Mom of our capes. Yes. Mom of all capes. Mom of all capes. She'll be yeah. here at the 10 o'clock hour. At about 9.30, 9.40, we'll be joined by Reverend Kenny Irby. So let's get started. We'll say goodbye to you for now. You'll be tweeting, sharing. Yes. Please follow them at Rose Horowitz and at Vandana underscore Menon. Thank you so much. Okay, let me bring in our, our guests first. I'm going to bring on Professor Nolewe Rooks, who is the W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of English at, Columbia, at uh, Cornell University. I'm going to bring her on. And just so grateful we first met when she was a guest on my radio show on WBAI 99.5 FM, Saturdays noon to two. I learned so much from her. I asked her if she would be kind enough to come back and uh, spend some time with us today on Juneteenth. We really wanted her here. And here she is. Please say hello, everyone, to Professor Rooks. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations. Your Century Show. It's an honor <laughs> to be here to celebrate it with you. Thank you so much. We've uh, we've only known each other for a couple of weeks, but I've been so inspired by the messages that you have shared, not just on my show, but just also on Twitter. And I want everyone to follow her on Twitter. Uh, she is at N Rookie, N R O O K I E on Twitter, and you can follow her. And I'm going to show everybody this tweet that she shared just today, and it blew up the internet. She said, maybe if she wouldn't mind reading it to us. That would be an honor. Juneteenth is not the day all black people in the world were emancipated, the day all people in the United States were emancipated, 
A few states waited for the 13th Amendment to be ratified. The day black people became citizens or the end of our freedom story. And look at that, 26,000 tweets and retweets and likes. And today was a busy day, so to break through that was, yeah. would have been tough. But it says something about what you were sharing, the wisdom and the insights, and there's just a few characters. And someone of your stature using Twitter like that, I think, is eye-opening for a lot of folks. And we are very grateful to you. Before we bring on our other guest, Brandy Harden, who's a lawyer and a board member of Justice Aid, I wanted to uh, ask you the question I ask everybody. How are you? And uh, how's your family through all the COVID and the 100 days of lockdown? You know, I am blessed. Uh, all, my entire family, we have a small family, but everybody in it is healthy. Uh, everybody in it is got a place to live, enough to eat, um, and is doing well. And that's really, in these days, it's no small thing. We're grateful for every little bit. Thank you so much. Let me now bring on our guest, Brandy. Pardon. Thank you so much for being here, Brandy. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. How are you? Hi. Thank you so much for having me. No, we're, we're delighted and honored to have you. Uh, same question. How are you? How's your family? I am good. Um, in my world, we call this house arrest. Um, <laughs> uh, I will also take from Profe Professor Rooks and say that I'm too blessed to be stressed. So it's just me and my mom. Um, that are living in D.C. and both of us are healthy and safe and happy. Yeah. Great to hear. Great to hear. Uh, you also shared something today. You wrote a message to us. I don't know if you have your phone handy and can pull that up if you, if you wouldn't mind doing that. We'd yeah. love to hear that whenever you're ready. Okay, you, sure. Yeah. And uh, I'll just say that she's with Justice. She's a board member of Justice Aid, but she's also a lawyer and she, she's, uh, she studied at Howard University and she taught at Harvard and is someone who has made it her mission to help uh, help all kinds of folks who need uh, help at this time with the legal system. And she's been just great to get to know. So go ahead, Brandy, whenever you're ready. Okay, yes, thanks so much. We will use today, June 19th, 2020, Juneteenth, to remind us that 155 years later, slavery still exists. We will use today to remind us that all persons in the United States still are not free, according to the 13th Amendment. We will use today to remind us that even after the so-called abolition of slavery, June 19, 1865, Juneteenth, the American Constitution held on to one exception for slavery. That exception, punishment for conviction of crime. Just as the movie 13th explained, sanctioning slavery in the prison context is rooted in the black codes. Constitutionally sanctioned slavery has a direct correlation to mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex, and in turn, to corrupt policing. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the person shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. December 6th, 1865, June 10th, 2020, 155 years later, let us not forget. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that was beautiful. Uh, tell us uh, the, you know, this a lifetime of words, uh, of, of, of experience in, that, in those words. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your work and how that's connected to what you just shared with us? Absolutely, um, and I'm gonna start with, I'm a Texan. So Juneteenth is really near and dear to me. Uh, it's something that I grew up celebrating. It's something that I always, um, as a youngster, thought was a, a big holiday. And it was not until I got sort of older, maybe a little wiser, uh, that I found out what was really happening. Um, what I would say is that I was a public defender for almost nine years. Uh, I then went into private practice where I still continue to represent indigent people in the criminal defense world uh, that can't afford a lawyer. And for me, uh, the 13th Amendment has special significance because far too often, black and brown men are the people who are in prison. And if you look to the movie 13th, uh, in fact, what's happening is that those bodies, those humans, those lives 
are still being used as slaves. Um, so it it motivates me every day. For the for the longest time while I was at the Public Defender Service, I had that up on my door long before the movie Thirteenth came out. So you can imagine uh, my delight once the movie came out that the world was finally getting to know that slavery is still written in our constitution. I don't think most people understand that. And that's something that we want to talk about today as well. Uh, Professor Rooks, your thoughts on what she said and also how are you thinking about Juneteenth today? You told us what it is not. Maybe you'll tell us what it is. Yeah, I... Uh... It is really quite something, you know, to have grown up in African American communities where Juneteenth was a holiday. We all celebrated it. It was something that we really um, took to heart. Um, it was part, uh, she said a little tongue in cheek, right? I mean, that, oh, the people in Texas didn't even know they were free for a very long time. But also, um, it was a, a, a kind of real acknowledgement of the United States government um, and owners and whiteness and the, the situation that uh, enslaved folks found themselves in, that they could have been free for either two years. So if you start with the Emancipation Proclamation, when it was um, read, freeing the, the uh, enslaved folks in Confederate states, two years passed between then and when uh, the folks there found out that they had in fact um, been freed. But even after that, uh, it was two months after the Civil War had ended that uh, they found out. And some of the, the reasons that you hear for why uh, that they didn't know, people rarely want to say, because their owners simply wanted them to stay slaves because uh, they were making a lot of money for them. They liked the ways that the world was organized. But you'll hear things like, oh, there was a very slow horse and a rider that was sent to tell them uh, that they were free and the, the rider got lost and the horse died. So literally you will hear people... Uh, uh, speculate about how could it be that this either two years or two months have passed and no one has told them. Um, and what I always like to point out is, you know, it, it, there were newspapers, you know, there were newspapers, there were uh, railroads, like people try to act like 1865 is such a, is a period of time akin to the Stone Age or Tudor England or something, right, where you only have horses to tell you stuff. There's wire services. Western Union, actually, you can send a telegram. There's absolutely no reason that the ruling class, that wealthy people, that the captains of industry, who's, who the owners of enslaved people were, would not have known. They simply wanted to keep Black people enslaved. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a story there about the law, the limits of the law, the limits of freedom, the limits of right, uh, ethics, and morality, but also the, the links that we will go to as a country to not name and claim, which is the truth um, of certain situations, the links that we will go to to make it seem like uh, it's, it's, it, it, uh, black oppression is just an accident, just a few bad apples, just, you know, something that went awry as opposed to a system that is operating the way that it's designed to operate. Thank you for sharing that with us. I'm struck by your phrasing of that. One of our guests on an earlier show was Adam Server, who wrote, I think, one of the most important articles of the first three years of the Trump administration. Whenever people complain that, that things are so cruel, why are they so cruel at the border? Why are they so cruel with the transgender folks or uh, the DACA situation. And by the way, great news on DACA for now. Yeah. And whenever they say that, his article said the headline was very simple. The cruelty is the point. It isn't like it's point. an aberration that things are cruel. That was the point of many aspects of this administration that people don't understand. 
And I, I want to let everybody know what we're doing here because we have a lot of new folks who've never seen the show and might be a little confused about where we are and what <laughs> we're doing. Welcome. Uh, my name is Sri Srinivasan, and these are my two of my awesome guests tonight. We have several folks where our, this is our hundredth episode of our daily program talking about all aspects of COVID-19. And we are here with Professor Nolue Rooks, who's at nrookie on Twitter. Please follow her. We're also with Brandy Harden, lawyer and board member of Justice Aid. Professor Rooks is the W.E. Du Bois professor at, at Cornell. And I see backstage waiting to join us in a couple of minutes is Reverend Kenny Irby. Uh, he's at Irby Man. Do follow him. He's a pastor and teacher and friend. And we will also be joined later by Jonathan Borstein, who's a writer who's watched all 99 episodes of this show. And um, I want to ask uh, uh, Brandy, uh, tell us about the work of Justice Aid and why it exists and how it's tied to the work that needs to happen going forward. Absolutely. So um, Justice Aid is a group of civil rights advocates, quite honestly, that use music um, and arts to raise money to support other civil rights organizations. Um, this year, we've had a lot of events and our main issue this year is voter suppression and election protection. Um, as you know, um, as people have seen, there have been a lot of problems already uh, with voting. And we wanna make sure we get out the vote, make sure that people's voices are heard and make sure that uh, things that people fought so hard for, civil rights that people fought, um, bled, shed blood for, and died for, that their voices are heard through voting. And so Justice Aid, uh, we have concerts, we have events where we raise money, uh, we donate to different organizations. And again, this year, our issue is election protection. So I hope everyone will join us uh, for our upcoming events. Uh, please also follow us on Twitter. Um, it's an awesome organization and we do lots to help civil rights organizations. I'm proud to be a board member of Justice Aid. I wanna just show everybody that thanks to Justice Aid, we had the founder, uh, Steve Milliken, and we did an amazing conversation just last week with uh, Reverend Kevin Van Hook, uh, who's Minister of Justice at the Riverside Church, and Marcia Johnson Blanco, who's co-director for Voting Rights Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. All of these shows, all 100 shows you can find on my archive in YouTube. So youtube.com slash Sweenet. Everybody, please find the archive, find these episodes, tag them, share them with your friends. They're all available thanks to our amazing guests like these folks. We're going to do uh, for everybody now our global tour, which we always do. We, uh, I want our guests to see people watching from around the world. Our first viewer is always Jonathan Borstein, and he'll be here later uh, by, uh, he'll be here himself on camera for the first time. Uh, Laura Silverman is watching from Philadelphia, and hey. folks, feel free to give shout outs for any of your favorite cities as you see them. Yeah. Rod Young is watching from Long Island. Doug Levy is watching from California. Michael, uh, I'm sorry, Michelle Raphael is watching from uh, California too, uh, Southern California, and she's happy Juneteenth. Uh, Marilyn is watching from Staten Island. Marilyn, we have to get you on the show. Marilyn, uh, yeah. Nero, uh, Neil Parekh, who's executive producer of our New York Times Read Along. This Sunday, Tom Jolly, print editor of the New York Times, will be here to read print newspapers with us and talk about the future of those with, with, with us. Courtney is here. 100 amazing shows, she says. She's watching from Tucson. By the way, to both our, uh, both our guests, want to say, uh, isn't it amazing that those city, those states that have uh, been the ones that are been against mas using masks and against the shutdown are now where the spikes are. And I take no pleasure in seeing right. those spikes. It is terrible to see what's happening in Florida, Arizona, and then Oklahoma on the day. They just had the highest single total Ever. of coronavirus cases. The president is going in insisting against everybody's directions and pleading, saying, we're going to have that you know, 10, 20,000 people crowded into a closed space. And by the way, pointing to protesters who are outdoors, who are fighting systemic oppression and who are wanting to be out there on their own and, and, and raise a voice and comparing that to what he's doing. Professor Rooks, your thoughts on, on just that comparison. I, I mean, it's hard to talk about the president. I mean, what we're seeing here um, in terms of the, the race-based 
truth um, of the differences that are that are in this country and the race based truth, the antipathy that the White House uh, seems to have, that members of the White House certainly from from where I'm sitting seem to have to ideas of citizenship, right? Not it, it began with the citizenship for people who had immigrated to the United States, but increasingly we're just seeing antipathy toward citizens. So American citizens with a right to protest, um, American citizens who believe that, they sh that their government should protect them, um, that they have certain claims that they should be able to make um, are, are regularly shut down. And in this instance, um, what you're seeing is, you know, if Trump supporters want to go maskless uh, in, in the, the convention center, that's fine. The problem is they have to leave the convention center. Um, and they leave this convention center with their infections, with their germs, with their COVID, and infect others. Um, and the lack of desire on behalf of the president, the White House, people around him, to make sure that you're keeping American citizens safe, um, it is, is, it's flabbergasting uh, that, that, that we, we can't expect um, better from him. And it is uh, just a truth of why he would go to Tul Tulsa, Oklahoma. We can talk about that later, but what, what would lead him initially for Juneteenth, but eventually uh, the day after to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma um, on a day after uh, we should be talking about freedom and what that means uh, and engage in this sort of reckless behavior, this disrespectful behavior, uh, there really, there are no words. There are no words. There, are, I, I think there are words. They're just words that we may not be able to share on a family show yeah. for, for some of this. And just we can point out, and Brandy can help me with this. We had our guest, Tramari Wills, on the show, who wrote a book about the first six African-American slaves to escape and became, become millionaires. And one of them was from Tulsa, Oklahoma, where there was a place known as Black Wall Street, yeah. where there were so many rich or well-to-do African-Americans that a white mob one day went in and attacked and killed hundreds of African-Americans with no, no, not that there would be any pretext or context where it'd be okay, of course, but for no reason they attacked and, and killed. It should be a site of mourning, not where President Trump shows up. But we know our history. There was a reason Ronald Reagan, the candidate, started his campaign in a specific place, and there's no accident that President Trump is in Tulsa tomorrow. I think that's right. Um, one of the things that it shows for me, outside of just uh, sort of the brashness of the move, is just how divided the country really is. Um, I think that we sort of are able to see people who are endorsing the trip, people who are endorsing no masks, um, show us the level of division that we have in the country. And I think it's a lot less about whether or not people are actually gonna show up for this rally, but says a lot more about where we are in terms of race relations, the significance of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the significance of going to a place without having a conversation about uh, the significance of the, the massacre that took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I think just speaks to where we are as a country and lets us know we still have a long way to go. We do, do, you um, mind, do you mind if I just really, really fast, I just want to make sure it's the, the little bit of historian in me that people actually know what happened um, in, in, in Tulsa. So uh, there was a, a young man who was 18 years old who was heading into an uh, uh, office building, got into the elevator where there was a white woman, um, a little bit older in the elevator. The doors close, they go up three or four floors. When the doors open, the white woman is screaming and the young man runs out of the elevator. He later told people that what happened was when the elevator started to move, she tripped 
And he, as a reflex, reflexively just sort of reached out to, to catch her. Um, she screamed at the top of her lungs at his touching her, even if it was inadvertent. And when the doors opened and he ran and she was left and they asked what has happened, he said, she said, he tried to rape me. Um, in an elevator going up two flights, um, he was was captured, was taken to the courthouse. Uh, the police stood by a mob form to get him because, you know, he had tried to rape a white woman. Um, the police stood back and allowed uh, the mob to come and get him. They lynched him. But their bloodlust was such um, that it wasn't enough. And so they, they turned uh, and, and after murdering this young 18-year-old, uh, burned, uh, killed 300 people, burned all the homes to the ground. It, a thriving area became a big field with just r smoking ruins and dead bodies. And thousands of people were uh, left homeless. Immediately reduced from one of the wealthiest uh, African-American areas and biggest accomplishments for relatively newly freed people, people who had not uh, known freedom for that long, um, to, to rubble, to beggars, to paupers, and the insurance companies would not pay, um, pay them for their homes. So the, the differences in, again, citizenship, protection, the law, police, respect for bodies, respect for black people, um, respect for the law, white respect for the law are all encapsulated right there in, in Tulsa. And sometimes people don't exactly know what happened. So I just wanted to take a second um, to kind of share that. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's important that context really matters. I recommend Shamari Wills's book, Black Fortunes, which has a component of that, but also talks about how black wealth is created and has been created in this country and how it's been lost and the role that slavery played in everything that has happened ever since. And that's so important for folks to understand. I'm just gonna bring on to the stage now, our friend, Reverend Kenny Irby. Uh, he is a pastor and journalist and writer and teacher, and I'm proud to call him my friend. Please welcome Kenny Irby. Reverend Irby. Hi there, Sri. How, how's everybody? It's good to see you. It's uh, great to been listening in the background, uh, just uh, absorbing the uh, the wisdom and the passion. It's good to be here. Thank you. I want to share with everyone, if I could, your amazing article that you wrote. Uh, if you will tell us what this is, just starting with the title, it says, kneel in humility, then stand up for what's right. And there's a picture of you kneeling. Uh, the Reverend Kenny Irby kneels and prays with protesters outside St. Petersburg Police Department on June 2nd. So this was, uh, talk about this article about your work. This is not by you, it's about you. Well, yeah, it's not by me, it was about me. Um, uh, and it's a, a wonderful opportunity to, uh, like so much of what we're experiencing now, to, uh, to reveal some insight and context to the real meaning uh, for why um, particularly African-Americans are passionate about certain uh, acts and uh, activities. Uh, and so this was a piece uh, I was approached by a writer uh, for our local newspaper here, the Tampa Bay Times, um, who had heard about uh, an incident the day before where um, Chief Holloway and I went to the aid of a, of a protester um, who had been clipped by, by an automobile uh, and was lying in the streets. And uh, we went to render aid and uh, then turned around and were between the police headquarters and the uh, and uh, the protesters. The pro protesters were between us. We had to go through the protesters to get back to the barricade. And uh, we, we endured quite a bit of ridicule and harassment. And uh, you know me, Sri, um, I uh, engaged uh, and asked the question, you know, why couldn't we have dialogue and not diatribe? Um, in the midst of that conversation, uh, I was constantly asked, uh, uh, or it was insisted, 
uh, and, and instructed and demanded to kneel. Uh, and uh, I asked the question uh, to a group of the protest leaders, why was that so important to them? Um, because I wouldn't kneel just because they wanted me to kneel. I had to, I would kneel as a man of, of God, as a person of faith, um, for a, a particular reason with uh, reverence and with humility. That led to this, this photograph. Um, and uh, somebody in the crowd said, let the preacher pray, let the preacher pray. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so the spirit moved and uh, that created this opportunity uh, that was documented by one of the broadcast journalists that was there. Um, the next day, uh, the writer asked me about that. I recounted uh, and uh, he asked me uh, in an interview what story I thought hadn't been told. Uh, and I said, uh, the significance of, of, of kneeling, uh, the idea of taking a knee uh, for positive reasons, uh, not for the, the violent dynamic of what we saw uh, in Minneapolis and how George Floyd lost his life. Uh, thank you, uh, Reverend. Can you just uh, tell us about your work with the police department and how you see it fit in with the work you're doing and the context of everything going on now? I'll just read the line here. It says, Irby is, is, is pastor at the historic Bethel AME Church in St. Petersburg, the oldest predominantly African-American church in the city. He's also a former journalist and he's director of community intervention and juvenile outreach for the police department. How do you reconcile some of the things that have been happening, working with the police for yourself, but as well as nationwide, what's happening with the protests? Well, um, uh, I wouldn't trade anything for the journey and I never, uh, I never anticipated uh, being working in law enforcement um, in this way. Um, uh, the, the, the way um, that my journey led to this role was five years ago uh, after a very violent period here in, in the city of St. Petersburg where we lost seven uh, young men to senseless gun violence. Um, and uh, I was leaving the Pointer Institute in a role that I had been in uh, for 20 years. Um, the, the mayor and the chief of police uh, independently asked me to consider staying in the in the area to continue some work that I had started uh, in role modeling and life skill programs for uh, for young men. And um, through some conversations uh, and, and real soul searching, um, I felt uh, it was time. I, I, I'll tell you very honestly, I asked the Lord to give me a, a real challenge. I had uh, felt like I had um, not given all that I could to community. I'd done a lot and been very successful in my individual work uh, in journalism, and uh, this opportunity came. And so I was uh, invited to uh, to architect the original program uh, for the city of St. Petersburg uh, under the My Brother's Keeper initiative from President Obama. Uh, and St. Petersburg was the only city that we know of that pivoted and created the My Brother's and Sister's Keeper initiative. Uh, and so I uh, helped to create that that initiative uh, that offered a series of programming and educational, entrepreneurial, and enrichment uh, opportunities for 24, 12 to 24 year old uh, at risk youth. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, and in this past year, um, Chief Holloway added uh, the juvenile outreach uh, efforts uh, under my umbrella. So all of the second chance programs uh, that help to keep young people from getting a record. It's a juvenile uh, civil citation program uh, that's available here in the city. So we um, have made some tremendous inroads uh, here in, in the city. And uh, we noticed that while many other cities uh, had very violent uh, uh, outbreak uh, here in the city, we did not have that kind of rioting. Um, most of our writing uh, was peaceful. There were not, there was no looting and burning uh, here in the city. And we attribute a big part of that, not solely, uh, but to the fact that we built relationships during times of calm that we were able to leverage uh, and build on during the time of crisis uh, that went on and uh, that's been going on in, in, in America. Uh, Reverend, before I bring in the our other guests to maybe ask you a question or two, I just want to I want everyone to see this video that's so heartbreaking. I know you've seen it. 
surveillance photo of a boy playing uh, and as the police passes, they he goes he's like hiding behind for doing nothing in his own backyard. I saw it. Yeah. You, you, you've seen that video. Um, what do you make of that? What is yeah, your? I have. I yes. Have. What, do, what do you say to people who don't understand that boy's thinking that he needs to hide from the police in his own, not even backyard, in his own front yard? I just I'm heartbroken seeing that because I can imagine. Um, this is not something that my son would ever have to deal with. This is the unfairness of this country that they did, that he has grown up thinking like that. Please talk about that, and then I want our other guests to jump in as well. Please. Well, I mean that that's uh, that's a reality that uh, young black people, not just black boys, uh, particularly boys, but black people in uh, you know across the diaspora uh, feel because of the oppression that they. have uh, have learned to to cope with. You know, I wrote in my CNN uh, column, the one that I did write, um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I think a, a big part of what we're seeing has been the normalizing of rage and uh, the racist system uh, that uh, the previous segment uh, your guest um, talked about uh, is something that we have learned to, to live with. Uh, and uh, law enforcement has not been in many, too far too many cases uh, uh, pursuing the, the role and the responsibility of protectors and uh, guardians of the community. Uh, and so they are, they are viewed as the warriors and the enemies uh, in many of these communities where uh, people of color live and uh, make their habitat. Thank you. Let me ask Brandy to respond to what she's been saying and what she's been hearing, sorry, what we've been talking about. And then I'll ask Professor Rooks as well. Brandy. Absolutely. Thanks again. Um, thanks so much. You know, I watched that video and like Reverend Irby said, it's everybody Black's reality. Um, that's a young child, but I want to say that as a Black woman, as a professional, as a lawyer, none of it matters. I will be treated that same way, that is have that same fear um, for the police. One of my friends posted uh, something on Instagram, I don't do social media, that said, being black is checking your rear view mirror every time you pass a cop to see if he's turning around. I I'm just, I'm almost sure everybody on this um, podcast tonight can say that that has happened. I mean, you, it just has happened. You, you pass a police officer, you've done absolutely nothing wrong. You're not committing any crime, but the level of nervousness I think that black people have in interacting with the police is real and starts from that age uh, through my age. Uh, I think it just doesn't ever stop. And so uh, like Reverend Irby said, it's our reality. Professor Rooks, uh, please go ahead. I'm going to step out and I want the three of you to have a conversation. Oh, sure. Okay. Well, uh, I wanted to say, Reverend Irby, I'm actually uh, grew up in Clearwater, Florida, um, close to you in Pinellas oh. County. Yeah. 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 My uh, grandparents mm -hmm. lived in Clearwater and I split years between my mother uh, at San Francisco and the two of them um, in Clearwater. And one of the things that I thought about when we saw that that image really was how intractable uh, the tensions and the violence uh, on behalf of the police toward black people are. You know, sometimes you'll hear young people say, we've really not made a whole lot of progress. America is the same now as it's always been, which is just not true. Um, there, okay. There's some things we still need to fix, but. Yeah. Uh, it is just simply not the case that we haven't made progress. So we have made progress in things like voting. We have to stay vigilant. Uh, <laughs> we have to stay in there and keep keep fighting to make sure that things don't get rolled back. But there was a time when just the idea of voting, not that they made it hard, it was impossible That's for right. black people to vote. Possibly, yeah. Or, or just black freedom. Right. You know, we can talk about the shackles that are placed on black freedom, but there's a difference between being enslaved and being oppressed. Um, mm -hmm. th th these are Absolutely. You know, different things. One one area that we have not, I think, as a group made real progress with is around the ways that uh, the police, uh, an entity that was formed during 
the antebellum period, um, the police come out of slave patrols. Like the reason we have right. organized, right. armed folks um, who are supposed to be protecting property and the public good, that property was black people. Um, and that pr- public good was slave owners. So there's a race narrative um, about the relationship of the police and policing to black people up through the Black Panther Party, you know, the Black Power period. That was, that was, they were the Black Panther Party for armed self-defense. And the self-defense was not against random white people. (laughs) It was against the ways that the police were preying on, abusing um, black communities. So that remains uh, an, an area in the black freedom struggle that that this is the first time that I'm hearing calls with things like uh, defund the police, abolish the police. Like, right, let's take the money, let's take the source of their funds where they're buying tanks and rocket launchers. Like I literally saw that the school police in Los Angeles had rocket launchers and tanks. The school police, who exactly are people who are uh, policing School. schools yeah, yeah. Right. going to be riding down on <laughs> in tanks or with rocket launchers. So take some of that funding, right, and put it into schools. They don't need, they don't need tanks. I, don't, I just don't think it's, there's a universe within which the, 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 the Los Angeles school district police uh, need a tank. Uh, but those things are expensive. So we're starting to see calls for, let's look at what do police actually do? Right. Right. Like, what is it most of the time? Most of the time. What, what, are, what do they spend time doing? And I can say, and then I'll stop. The last three times that I called the police, and it's always, it's a hard thing as a Black person to call the police. Once, my father, who's living in Clearwater, uh, we could not get in touch with him. He was older. He was having some health, health challenges. He wouldn't answer the phone. People who, family members... You know, we're going, he wouldn't answer. He changed the locks so nobody had a key to the house unbeknownst to any of us. So at some point we did a wellness check. You know, police will go in and check on uh, your your loved ones. The first time they went, he was in there. They scared him to death. Nothing bad happened. The second time he had passed and had been there about two weeks. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, what other options? That there should have been other options other than sending the police on this kind of errand um, twice. Once a uh, uh, upstairs neighbor was in the middle of a domestic dispute and was just getting wailed on. And my husband and I were like, we're not like, we're, we're, we're not able to run in there, or bust down the door and, and uh, you know, <laughs> intervene, but we were hearing her uh, be brutalized. And so we finally called the police. But again, these are, are uh, they, those those situations should not be as soul searching as they are, um, and they really should not be the reasons to call. Maybe maybe for the beating, but certainly not for a wellness check. So we're at a point where people are kind of like, well, what do the police actually do? What are we funding them to do? And maybe we should talk about um, reallocating that money somewhere else. I think that's really important, um, and, and, and you're right on the, the, the reality that the police department's history is definitely one uh, that's in line with, with racist intent uh, and uh, creation. And now in the 21st century, everything that happens within a society is also added to the police department, homeless uh, mm-hmm. People right. sh- shouldn't be getting a call, but we get the calls for from law enforcement to deal mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with behavioral health issues. Um, and quite honestly, uh, you're absolutely right. And and we're moving in that direction uh, in St. Petersburg. You might recall Chief Holloway, our chief now, was a chief in Clearwater. Uh, yeah. And uh, has been nationally known for implementing the park, walk and talk uh, strategy that really does bring law enforcement back to building relationships during times of calm, Mm -hmm. working out alternative strategies uh, for community uh, building and uh, uh, as a part of that guardian role. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and it takes time. We've we've reached out to the faith community to be a part. I just came in tonight. That's why I'm in my t-shirt and my not my son t-shirt 
Um, one of our youth campaigns is to, to stop violence and connect young people in inner city uh, communities with uh, with resource programs, the, the cohort of champions and men in the making and, and uh, those kinds of activities that redirect the energy and create opportunities uh, for young people in our communities. And that's heavily, that, that work emanates from within the police department. Hmm. Does hmm. it have to, should it? And in most places people would say no, uh, but you know, every community is different yeah. Uh, and here in St. Petersburg, we have that kind of momentum uh, and uh, and we're building on that. I think it um it really Randy, matters. I'm sorry, I can't mm -hmm. hear you. So I, uh, <laughs> that's my that's my challenge. Huh. I see the passion. Nothing. You can, hear, you can you hear me now? <laughs> nothing. You can hear nothing. No, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Reverend Norby to step. I was going to ask him to step, leave the studio and come back in. Sometimes that fixes the problem. So he's going to do that. Meanwhile, we're just going to do uh, uh, welcome some other folks and their comments. Or uh, Kenny, if you just step out and step back in, we'll we'll bring you right back. Thank you. Uh, let's see if now Kenny can not hear me either. Can you can you hear me, Brandy? Hear nobody, Kenny. Can't hear you. Nothing. <laughs> okay. So one second. So um, we were hearing um, Brandy. You can hear me though, right? You yes, can I can hear. actually hear you. I can hear. Yes, and I could hear both of you too. And I, I heard hear Kenny, every word that Kenny said. I stepped out because I felt that I wanted to hear the three of you talk, and it was a beautiful thing to hear the three of you sharing your 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 insights and your thoughts. Let's just look at some of the other comments that have been coming in. Uh, Jacqueline says, tell it, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Rooks. And <laughs> Denise says, congrats. Um, Lippy is here. Lippy Roy was our very first guest. Dr. Lippy Roy was wow. our first guest. And soon after she came on, they snapped, snatched her up at, w, at, uh, at NBC and MSNBC, and she's now a doctor on their network. And so we're very proud of her. Uh, we're also uh, joined by Jacqueline Dolly, who says racist signifying is at an all time high. And I think that's really important. And I want to tell you all that she's our guest tomorrow. We're very excited to have her. Tomorrow, we're trying something different. We've been talking about all the problems. Well, let's look ahead. And with the terrible employment problem, what are we going to do to help everyone of all backgrounds? And so we brought a terrific career strategist to be with us. And Jacqueline Dolly is going to be here. Uh, check out her website, Be Do Have Results. And she's a work culture architect, performance optimizer, breakthrough navigator, and much more. And she'll be with us tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern on a Saturday, sharing information, but also never forgetting the issues at hand, because we definitely want to uh, talk about them also uh, with, uh, with her and everybody else who's watching. Let's just see a couple more comments, and then we'll come back to you. Um, uh, Apollo says, Tulsa is no different from what we see in places where social classes are targeted for li liquidations to enfeeble the, to enable the, to, en to enfeeble the rest like the Poles uh, during Hitler's invasion. Uh, we have just so many comments coming in. Therese is here, says, congratulations. Uh, Thought provoking and welcoming a global community. Uh, very, very grateful. Uh, Renee is here. Renee has been a supporter from day one, arranged for lots of different folks to uh, come in and uh, and be uh, sponsors for us. We're very grateful. Bill Mitchell says, happy Juneteenth from Bill in Boston. And b this is not the other, is a Bill Mitchell who's famous online, a right-wing person. This is the good Bill Mitchell. <laughs> and, uh, and Bill is a former colleague of, of uh, Reverend Kenny Irby. And if Kenny can hear us, or if my producers can message him from the calendar invite to say we want him back, he just has to re reboot and come back. We'd love to have him. And Jennifer says that Brandy is a wonderful ambassador for justice aid and is a justice hero. And here is Mark saying that a good friend of his is the W.E. Du Bois professor at Duke and a big fan of reparations. Now, let me say to Professor Rooks what I said to you when I met you. What an unbelievable legacy to be the W.E. Du, du Bois professor. And what does that mean to you today? And not enough people still know all the things that he did and the influence he had. Could you talk about him for a couple of minutes for us, please? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, du Bois, Professor Du Bois um, was a Renaissance kind of figure. He is renowned as an organizer, a philosopher, an intellectual. 
he's considered the father of sociology, not black sociology, but the practice of sociology. Um, with his groundbreaking work, uh, The Philadelphia Negro, where he actually went and collected data, hard data, like let's talk about what is uh, happening in, in black working class and poor communities. Uh, he was a co-founder of the NAACP, uh, 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 editor of Crisis Magazine, one of the first magazines to really draw together uh, black artistic uh, opining about it with black freedom struggles. He changed a lot, like his philosophy over time um, really went from not accommodationist, but as someone who wanted to explain, who really truly believed if we could just explain to white people who they are and who we are as black people, they'll stop, they'll get their foot off of our neck. Um, over the arc of his life, he, he uh, ended really believing America was, was broken, irredeemably so. And that uh, he, he died in Ghana in exile uh, and calling for a kind of global black freedom struggle rooted in um, an intellectual thought that was about black freedom. Um, he, he's a, a complex figure and it is a complete honor um, to have a chair that, that has his name. Thank you. Uh, we want to just show some of the other comments coming in. Uh, Joy says, wish you all the best. Uh, thousands of episodes to bring the different perspectives all over the world. I hope it's not thousands in the years ahead. Uh, Jacqueline says, a major indictment of our law enforcement system is that police believe that they either have unchecked power to do as they will, or they withdraw their services. There is no middle ground. We saw that today. Police officers going on strike, in effect, in um, a Atlanta. Yeah, in Atlanta, just uh, how is that possible? Brandy, can you explain some of that for us, please? Um, I think there's just a lot of resentment. I think police officers absolutely believe that it's based in the law, quite honestly, that they are immune. I mean, right, there's a there's a, an actual statute that, that discusses qualified immunity. That is, no matter what a police officer does, uh, nine times out of 10, a jurisdiction where they work is going to allow them to get away with whatever crime. They're not able to be sued. The departments are not able to be held liable. And when police officers see district attorneys, prosecutor's offices, lodging charges against police officers, when they thought that they could not be held accountable in that way, there's a lot of resent. Um, and I feel like that's why they walked out in Atlanta. I don't think it's gonna be the first or the last time we see it happen. Um, as you know, we're waiting on, the black community is waiting on charges in the Breonna Taylor murder. And so I, I can imagine that if and when those charges come, there will be police officers who resent the fact that those officers um, have been charged in that way. And, you know, we saw it today there as well. The, there's a police officer who's going to be fired. Um, and if his conduct was so egregious, right, that it's, it's eligible for termination, how has he remained on the books for three months? What was not fireable three months ago? And so I think that you see officers who get upset when they are held accountable and there's a lot of resent surrounding uh, that kind of accountability. Sure, now uh, Professor Rooks, uh, what do you think about where we go from here? I wanna, uh, you know, we're gonna move on to our next hour and I've already kept you past uh, 10 o'clock uh, time. I just want to ask you, uh, what gives you hope? What gives you uh, hope for all of us as we're trying to understand this very complex time we're living in? Oh, sorry, one second. We're, we're just going to, sorry, go ahead. Okay. So the times that we've actually seen systemic change come about, um, some of the ingredients that have been included in that have been global, multiracial, multi, um, uh, generational calls for change. Um, I'm thinking about the civil rights movement, certainly. I'm thinking about the abolitionist movement. And when the battle is joined um, and when the cry is freedom, we see, again, we're not, it's not perfect. They're not waving a wand. Not, not all bad things are going away. But we see 
uh, substantive progress moving forward. And what has happened that is, I think, caught many um, unawares is this is a global, you have people in Brisbane, people in London, people in Paris, you know, tens of thousands, as well as uh, all, I think all 50 states have had um, major protests saying, you know, stop killing black people. Now the, the calls are becoming more robust, right? Like we want to see equity, we want to see justice, we want uh, educational equity, we want um, uh, co in corporate America, we want to see things different, we want full employment, like the calls are changing, but what call for the, those bodies into the street had to do with the murders of unarmed black people. Um, I, 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 that, that, that's just hopeful because that I, I believe what I know, what the world has taught me is that when you have those pieces in place, um, you, you change can come, change is coming. And so I, 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 I have faith. I, I believe I'm not a person of deep faith. A lot of the time I tend towards cynicism, but here I have faith that we will see some substantive changes, but as Angela Davis says, freedom is a constant struggle. So the other thing I would say is we can't expect this moment of protest to deliver everything we want for freedom. Um, but I think something's coming. I believe something's coming. Um, and so that gives me hope. Well, that gives me goosebumps. So I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Before you go, the professor has to be asked about the fall and how you're feeling about online learning this summer and spring and uh, where where are you on that continuum and uh, how are you yeah, doing? I, I can, luckily for me, uh, I, I teach at a school that is giving professors the choice uh, of where, how they want to teach. But in a in a larger kind of um, kind of conversation, the thing about returning universities, schools. Uh, K through 12, as well as higher education um, to, to full capacity is what we know are the people who are most at risk and, and most impacted um, are the most vulnerable. So on college campuses, you know, we'd be thinking about the janitorial folks, um, the maintenance people who clean up after the students, who serve the students food. Um, they're the people who are going to be most at risk and much of the conversation about should we come back or not really revolves around the students. Can we keep students safe? So in some ways, as the conversation unrolls, again, though I, though I am privileged to be at a school that is, you know, saying you don't have to have a doctor's note, you don't have to, you know, uh, open up your medical records and convince us that you shouldn't be in the classroom. Just the fact that we're in a global pandemic and you don't want to teach face to face is for the moment enough. But that's not the case of the places at other schools where they're being told you can be fired um, if you do not come and perform you know, your job. And so even uh, people who PhD have in people, people who don't think of themselves as essential workers in the ways that we've been talking about, who essential workers are and what they have to do, are faced with, do you, do you want uh, a, a, your paycheck or do you want your health? Um, and I think all of these choices that we're being asked to make is, is a part of why you see people out in the streets saying, this is a society that's sick. It's a, it's a society that's ill, that forces people into those kinds of choices. Um, without thinking in any kind of way creatively about what else we could do. So I I, uh, I guess we're, I guess everybody's opening up. Everybody seems really committed to it. Doesn't seem to be going well many places where it happens. However, we're committed to it. Um, but I hope that folks will really keep, keep a mind out for the least of these who, who as is always the case, um, those are the folks who, who are, are uh, gonna struggle and be impacted. Thank you so much, Professor. We're very grateful for your time tonight. And I hope you wouldn't mind joining us again in a future episode. Oh, of course. I love y'all. And congratulations again, 100 Absolutely. episodes. That is no small thing. Uh, I'm just going to... This is what my students do. My students don't clap, right? right. My students do this, right? So now, so now I'm like giving you all the snaps. That's right. Before you go, I'm just going to show once again your tweet. And if you wouldn't mind reading it to us again, 
Uh, we loved uh, your rendition of it and the words have so much meaning. So I'm gonna put that on the screen. So Juneteenth is not the day all black people in the world were emancipated is not the day all black people in the United States were emancipated since a few states waited for the 13th amendment to be ratified, is not the day black people became citizens, is not the end of the freedom story. Thank you so much. We'll leave it there with you at that. At N Rookie, please follow her. She's anything but a rookie. She's a veteran who is a wonderful writer, teacher. We had one of her students on with us the last time. At Poverty Scholar was with us, and we learned so much together with Professor Michener. Now she's a professor, and so are you. And so it was a great moment on the radio, and I got both of them talking after a while, even though they're both at Cornell. So thank you very much, and we'll see you. I'm going to talk to Brandy and then bring on our other guests. Thank you, okay, Professor. Bye-bye. Brandy, up to your, yeah. your thoughts. Uh, give us some hope as we go forward, please. So um, I will give you hope, but I also want to tell you and your audience what gives me hope. Um, and as a Black woman, what gives me hope is being Black. What I mean when I say that is to know that the struggle that my ancestors went through, that is from that transatlantic slave trade, to make it to the shores of America, set up shop, and my family coming from Texas, I realize that if those folks can get over that, I can do anything. Um, and I think the words that I give to your audience in terms of giving other folks hope is Frederick Douglass said, where there is no struggle, there is no progress. Um, I think we see the struggle. I think we've been going through the struggle. And on the other end of that is, in fact, progress. Um, so I just thank you for having me. I, I thank you for bringing attention to issues that have not been spoken about for so long in society, uh, for giving us a voice around Juneteenth. Again, I want to shout out my friends and family in Texas. Obviously, this is a big holiday for us. Um, and so, again, I just I think there's a lot of hope with the freedom fighters that are in the streets now. I think there's a lot of hope moving forward. And um, I look to the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much. We can't let you go without asking about the pictures behind you. That is my daddy. That is my daddy from, uh, he's from Monticello, New York. Um, and in the spirit of honoring our ancestors, I have him right up there on my wall. And those are all him? In That's right. All, all of them. them. Okay. All of them. All of them. Well, are him. Uh, my mom had them done for me uh, when I graduated from law school. So, yep, that's my daddy. All right. Please, uh, we, we, we are thinking of him, and uh, we're very grateful to you and your family. Thank you very much for being here, and we'll say goodnight to you as we continue the show. Thank you, and thank you for Justice Aid for uh, having me. Thank you. And folks, that was just the first part of our show. There's a special two-hour edition of the daily COVID-19 show. I want to bring back Kenny Irby, who, is, who dropped out, and he's here again with us. And then we have a very special guest who is also joining us. Hi, Kenny. Thanks for coming back. Uh, hey, no problem, Sri. You know, it's my honor. Thank you. So if you wouldn't mind hanging out with us for a little while, you tell us when you have to leave. We'll, 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 let you, we'll give you a chance to chat before you go. But I want to bring on now Amber. Coleman, uh, who is our guest. Hi, Amber. How are you doing? Hi. How are you? How's everyone tonight? This is, by the way, her her Twitter handle is fabulous. She's mom of all capes. So she, you know, Superman, Wonder Woman, they all have capes. So she's uh, at mom of all capes. That is Irby Man, at Irby Man, meet at mom of all capes. And I'm going to bring on my, our producers, Rose Horowitz and Vandana Menon, and they're going to have a little conversation uh, with uh, with all of us about some of the work that's going on. This is our second hour of the show, and we're just so grateful to have you all here. Rose and Vandana, our producers, they worked, Kenny, with me for 100 straight days, and they joined when the show had three people watching, and we just just got started, so we're very grateful to them. I want to um, have Rose set up uh, why we asked Amber to come back. She was just with us a few weeks ago. She did an amazing episode on how to talk to your kids about race. And she had her three beautiful daughters with us. And the four of them did a show together with us on how to think about race. They have the uh, Let's, Let's K-12 Better podcast that you all have to check out. So Rose, go ahead and set this up and then we'll show uh, the image of the amazing work that Amber did just today. Terrific. Hi, Amber. Hi. Hi, hi. hi everyone. 
Um, oh, Amber, yeah. you you are uh, <coughs> amazing in many ways. One, uh, you're the mother of those three daughters who were so amazingly, uh, so terrifically. Oh. Uh, and uh, gave such great answers when we had them on. Our Sorry, um, in the glance, which is uh, terrific. Awesome, thank you. Thank tell, you us so about, tell us about uh, your work with. Uh, can you tell us a little about where you are, or yes. tell us about this, what you created, and then we'll go backwards from there. Thank yeah, you. so I actually just put a the list together. I want to give a shout out to Elan. Um, who put this awesome graphic together um, from the list that I created. So um, I worked with Gender Avenger to do uh, work to elevate women's voices in the public uh, space. And that's like online, on TV, in your boardroom, um, wherever women's voices are not. Um, and so, you know, for Juneteenth, we were thinking about like, what are the ways that we can um, Think about how to celebrate this moment in time uh, where we're all focused on Juneteenth, we're all focused on this idea of liberation and elevating um, freedom, right? Um, and then thinking about like, where's the place where the intersections are, where women, um, LGBTQIA folks, right? Um, and where, what are their voices, right? And so this list kind of is an historic and contemporary um, bit of homage uh, to a lot of the black feminist, womanist, um, you know, thinking and, uh, uh, you know, ideologies um, across the span of history, right? So, you know, we have like Fannie Lou Hamer, um, who, you know, everyone knows she's just an amazing freedom fighter um, from the state of Mississippi, did a lot to um, help people register to vote down there when registering to vote was a life or death, death experience. Um, obviously, we have Sojourner Truth, who gave that really amazing speech, Ain't I a Woman? So we have that link there. You know, and then, we ha you know, we have the, the, the mothers who like Ida B. Wells and you know, Dorothy Height. But I also wanted to mix in the contemporary voices, um, uh, you know, of, of new, newer thinkers like Dr. Treva Lindsay and, you know, Joan Morgan, right? Um, so I wanted to make a mix, a, a long timeline of, of voices. Obviously, 19 slots. <laughs> You know, it's hard to pick who gets to come and who doesn't. Um, that was definitely a challenge, um, but, you know, wanted to just provide also a range of experiences and, and voices and ways of um, expressing yourself, right? So not just speeches and not just, um, you know, first person accounts. We wanted to provide poetry um, as well. So that's kind of the idea of what this is. I hope that people check it out. I would encourage you to purchase uh, these books from a black owned bookstore, right? Um, you know, so shout out to that. Um, if you can, we've linked a, a, you know, a list of different ones that you can find uh, right there. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's this list. Can yeah, black owned bookstores, I see that right there. That's, that's terrific. What are some brand names that people should know? Uh, so brand names, like as far as bookstores or as far as thinkers? You know, the bookstores, yeah. Oh, bookstores. Um, I actually, I am not quite well versed in that, and that's why I linked it. You know, because I did not know like where should I send people. So I was like, where can I find information so I can get people to where they want to be? Thank you. Perfect. Rose, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to ask you about um, the movement, the black black poets. Um, I see we have uh, Audrey Lord here, and uh, can you talk about that a little bit? And uh, we have, uh, who was else? Uh, well, Toni Morrison is uh, poetry in her in her novels. Uh, mm -hmm. And and uh, we we were able to have on this show, uh, we had Sapphire as a guest and uh, Nikki Grimes. Awesome. Yeah, so again, I didn't want to just provide nonfiction accounts, right? Or, um, you know, even uh, where you have like sociology and um, anthropology, right? I wanted to make sure that we allow or space to elevate art. I think, you know, for black people and black women, like we speak through drums, we speak through music, right? We speak through movement. Um, artistry is just an important part of the way that black people express themselves. Um, so I did want to pay homage to people like Intazaki Shange. You know, that's a play of, you know, and in fact, Treva B. Lindsay, Dr. Lindsay, whose book Colored No More, she actually and I are 
college friends. So I watched her put this play on um, and that's how I became introduced to into Zaki Shange. I was like, for color girls, this is amazing. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, I just wanna make sure that we um, just lift up artistry during this time of uh, turmoil, um, during this time of trauma for people, right? And just remind people to create, right? Like, it, you know, and, and also respect the creative, right? Respect the creative voices um, within the black uh, female uh, space, so. Thank you so much. That's a so one that. list. It's a great list. Kenny, do you want to comment gonna, on that? I was list? just saying that, yeah, as the father of four daughters, um, I'm looking at uh, you know works that my wife and I have shared with with our girls, and uh, it really does help build a sense of identity um, uh, and hopefulness when they when they see what other uh, African American women have done, uh, as Brandy was saying earlier, against uh, what appeared to be insurmountable odds. So that tenacity. Um, of the human spirit that it's manifested itself in uh, in black folk is is really special and needs to be a part of the the broader curriculum uh, in this country that's been neglected for so long. Absolutely, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more, and I hope you know. For me, this list is aspirational, right? Like you know, my daughters have read some of these thinkers. Um, you know, they're 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 still twelve, eleven, and nine, so some of it, you know, they have to wait to read. But you know, like just them to kind of formulate like, what is my identity, right? Um, the black mm -hmm. experience is not a monolith, you know. So like, there there's a beautiful tapestry of what black people are um, and what black people have experienced and how we express our love for self and our hope for a better life. And so, you know, I just wanted to kind of convey that with this list. I wanted to elevate as many voices as possible. Thank you. Um, I, I think, I don't know if uh, I can say this, but it seems like in the media, we hear more about the black men leaders who have been uh, leading the struggle for uh, civil rights than we do about the woman. Yeah, um, unfortunately, you know, because Diane Nash was doing amazing things, right? Like she's another woman who were like, hey, like let's push her up there and, and elevate her in this time too. Um, I do wanna say, you know, I, I have a lot of conversations with people about, you know, what does liberation look like? Especially when we're talking about Juneteenth, right? Like what does liberation look like? When we talk about liberation and freedom, especially in my home, you know, we think of it in the context of, we do not want to exchange um, anti-racism with like more patriarchy. So we don't want to say when we are fighting for and pushing for, you know, an anti-racist society, we don't necessarily want to say, okay, like at the expense of black women and LGBTQIA folks, we want to make sure that all people, right? We're all pushing here and we're all together. So we're not trading like, mm -hmm. um, you know, black liberation for black patriarchal liberation and then everybody else. Can I ask you that question? What do you try to tell your daughters, Kenny? Well, actually, I'm leaving the night. Um, my, my daughter's our youngest is uh, is 27, 27, ah. 30, and 33. So um, they, uh, we, you know, they have their they've developed their own uh, really strong self identity uh, by. Uh, you know, as you look behind me, the uh, artworks and the uh, expressions of literature um, that we have, uh, they, they talk about this room as a museum uh, because they're always being reinforced uh, with their history um, and uh, their potential. Um, and uh, so one of the things that, that, that women of color have contributed, or Black women we're talking about here tonight, um, have, have been able to uh, is to 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 be uh, near superhuman, right? So I, I like the idea of the the Wonder Women uh, in our in our families and our communities that have, uh, in my own experience, that have uh, taken a little uh, and created much. Uh, and so that uh, that idea of the the potential and the possibilities that they have are boundless. Um, and so we've, uh, we've, we've, we've been intentional about allowing them uh, to, to figure out their own space uh, and not do it 
the way we did it, but to uh, and not necessarily walk in in our path, but create new uh, avenues for themselves and 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 the future. It's great to hear, Amber. Any yeah, any favorite. um, any favorites right now of these of the nineteen women uh, from, so, your, from your daughters that 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 they love? Yeah. So favorites right now. Um, we are reading Audrey Lord as a bedtime story. <laughs> You know, just like putting the ideas of, um, you know, like feminist thought in their mind before they go to sleep. Like, what, do you, what are your dreams? And then in hope of what are your dreams? Like, whose shoulders are you already standing on? So shout out to you, uh, Kenny, for that. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, how do we build off of these ideas so that we can make the world better for the people who are coming next? And so Audrey Lord is definitely a favorite. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, Recommend everyone, you know, if you don't want to start off with a book, read Sojourner's Truth, Ain't I a Woman, right? Like, just read that speech. Um, and that's a great introduction into the intersections. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw yeah, really talks is. about intersectionality, right? So mm -hmm. read into that one to give you kind of an idea of, like, what is the Black female experience? Um, and then move from there It would be my recommendation. I just wanted to step in here and remind everyone who hasn't seen this yet to go back and watch this incredible interview that uh, that we were able to do with the mall of all capes and her three capettes. I don't know what we call them, but these amazing daughters uh, <laughs> who were Naima, Amber, uh, Sophia, and Garvey were all together and they used one camera and just topped up a storm. And I even learned that I, I shouldn't be calling them young ladies, I should be calling them women, not even young ladies, they're girls. And so we, we we learned a lot and I'm so grateful for that evening. That's one of the many things we've learned all of uh, during this show. You can find all our archives on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash net. And please go in and watch this episode. It was about a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I learned a lot in this 80 something, wasn't it, Amber? I think 80 something. Yeah, okay. And the kids had so much fun. They were like, oh my God, that was amazing. So thank you so much, Sri, for the opportunity. They loved it. They loved it. They're fans of you now. Thank you. And I promise them ice cream in New York when you uh, when you folks come up. Uh, I just yes. want to note that between our, uh, uh, so Rose and I are, for people who are watching for the first time, Rose and I are uh, producers of the show and our two guests are Amber and Kenny. Between those, our two guests, they have seven daughters and I want to hear uh, from Kenny uh, secrets of getting your 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 kids or especially your daughters to 27. Our twins are 17, a boy and a girl. And uh, we met, you and I met uh, 25 years ago in 1995 when That's I came right. out Pointer and the girls were That's very right. young. Obviously, right. Some of them were uh, not yet around. Some of them were already born. Talk about that and put that in context. We saw that video, horrifying video earlier of that young boy. How is it different for black girls? Uh, that you have seen in your work. And I, I, as we let you go for tonight, talk a little bit about hope and how what gives you hope and what should give us hope looking ahead. Well, the, the you know, my, certainly my daughter is 2020, you know, uh, in spite of COVID, uh, the uh, economic collapse and, and now the, uh, what some interpret as civil unrest in the, in the country, I think, um, uh, as was already stated, there's no progress with struggle. I think that Frederick Douglass quote is very apropos. Um, our daughters um, uh, are our biological, uh, well, our, our oldest daughter is actually adopted. You know that story. Um, and then we have three biological daughters. Uh, in 2020, one's getting married in October. And tonight, one uh, was just, uh, her labor was induced. And she's scheduled to deliver tomorrow morning sometime. So uh, wait, wait, wait! Oh my God! <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm finished. I'm fit. This is the last thing I'm doing. I'm taking a shower, get a couple of hours of sleep, and I'm getting on the road headed to Tallahassee in the morning. Uh, oh my just God! Just because of my friend. I'm oh, doing thank it. you, thank you. I, I'm so so. But uh, yeah, so Emily has her PhD. Our oldest daughter, our, our middle daughter, Kanitra, uh, is starting her um, her doctorate in ministry. She has her MDiv from Duke. Um, and uh, Kara uh, is a, a, a major uh, producer and uh, with the Florida League of Cities now after a career in, in journalism. And uh, Kachura, who's a young, his youngest, who's uh, scheduled to be married 
in in uh, in New Orleans in October 2020. Um, she's a social worker uh, here in in Florida. So they all have their grown, graduated, uh, and, and almost all married uh, as we uh, when we get to October. Um, they're fabulous women. Um, they're strong. They're independent, uh, and that's been a challenge for some of their husbands <laughs> because we we have. Uh, uh, we've, uh, as I said, we, we've uh, inspired them to blaze the trail, blaze their own trail, uh, and build off uh, this the uh, foundation that their mom and I have uh, been privileged to offer them. Um, and uh, I see promise for the future. You know, we have a youth program, Men and Women in the Making, um, that we have 55 boys and 37 girls in right now, and we've been doing youth outreach for 37 years. Um, and in the the resiliency of young people, when they have an identity uh, that is embedded with hope, um, and they understand that uh, the things that uh, that they will accomplish will come from hard work um, and uh, and love will will lead to uh, to justice, and they are committed to justice work in every aspect, um, and they have. Uh, a relationship with the creator so they have a sense of a positive identity and they know that their work is to make the world better um and that's what we've always uh continued to instill in them and we actually do that with every young person that we have the privilege of of interacting with and we do that same work uh from within our community uh, uh efforts and so our children uh are have been raised to be leaders and not followers uh, and, uh, and and I think that's the, the spirit that we have to nurture in our children. And there's unfortunately so many of the young people that we work with in the community, uh, to be very honest, uh, upon first engagement are hopeless um, because no one has ever taken the time to authenticate and validate their potential. Uh, and once you've done that, uh, you know, uh, possibilities uh, are boundless. So I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. I've spent time every day I go to the hill where our young protesters are, are gathering here. And uh, I had a conversation with another friend of ours tonight who's moved here. I don't know if you remember Clayton Sizemore, um, but he used to be at CNN in New York. Yeah. Uh, and we were out doing our rally tonight. And uh, he said to me, he said, Kenny, this work we have to do, we have to step back and not be out front and let them shape this new path. Advise them, encourage them, uh, and uh, and let them lead now. And I think that's uh, that's something people uh, of our uh, era have to do now and uh, keep hope alive from uh, from within and behind the ranks. Thank you. I'm and very hopeful. And I'm so grateful, and I want you to leave so that you can get ready and drive to your daughter yeah, yeah. in Tallahassee. Um, I just I want to see get, get some rest. But thank you so much, Amber. It was a pleasure. Yes. Uh, the shirt says, not my son. This is our, our program. Not another son of the city will die to census violence. That's been the, the thematic thrust of the, of the effort. Yeah. Thank you. And on the back is stronger together right there well, you're really i, I just want to say you're real the model and uh your grandkids are going to be are so lucky to have you as well as your daughters it's really really uh, inspiring to hear you speak about how you raised them thank you thank you kenny and i'll let thank you go you. thank you very much right. congratulations and we'll, we'll, you'll, you'll come back in a work. few You'll come back in a few months, show us your uh, your baby uh, in the photograph, okay? What, well, you know, I have to go document the uh, the continued evolution of the of the birth. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, take care. Bye-bye right. now. Thank you very much. For folks who don't know, uh, Kenny is a wonderful photographer. He used to teach photography at the uh, at Pointer Institute. And uh, big thanks to Stefan Kaplan, our friend, uh, who uh, uh, brought him into our 
uh, show today. Uh, Mom of all capes, we got to let you go. Uh, be with your family. It's well, a sad wanna, wanna night. Say something. She's going to be on the New York Times having a conversation with Tower Pope. Oh, yes. So mm -hmm. I hope that everyone can join. Um, I will be having another wonderful conversation um, with um, the wonderful Tara Parker Pope. Uh, we will be discussing how to raise a socially conscious anti-racist child. So there will be, we'll be open for questions. So as, essentially an extension of our conversation three. So like bring your questions, you know, bring, you know, the things that are pressing on your heart that you'd like to know. Um, hopefully I can find an answer for that or at least point you in the direction of where to go. But that is Wednesday, the 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And they can you find think? that, where can they find it? Uh, they can find that on the New York Times um, live events page. Nice. Uh, yes. Don't forget us now that you're hitting the big time, huh? Three? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Say hi. Never. Say hi. Thank to you so much, Amber. Great to see you. Say hi to your, your girls for us. I definitely will. Thank you, all. little woman. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and everybody, please follow at Mom of All Capes and at. Irby man. So uh, Rose, I'm going to let you uh, get a little break. We're going to bring Vandana on okay. and she's going to, uh, and you, I want you to come back at the end of the show as we'll okay. talk tomorrow. So much. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. That was a great conversation. Thank you all for watching. We have about another half hour to go. There's a special two hour edition of our hundredth episode. I'm learning so much. I know you are. Please share with a friend right now. I want to bring a couple of folks here. Uh, Vandana Menon, our producer who our other two producers rose mm -hmm. and Vandana, uh, uh, Vandana is going to help me now as we uh talk to a couple of very interesting folks who have who have joined us uh let's bring on jonathan borstein who has been here for 100 shows and now he's on the air with us after watching always first to watch hi jonathan hello how are you i'm okay i'm um Things are more or less quiet uh, at the moment. We had another bit of uh, demonstrations at uh, Union Square earlier during the day. And we're just very grateful to have you here. I'm going to have you and Vandana just chat a little bit. Vandana is going to talk to you about what it's like to watch this show for 100 episodes and some of your favorite moments. And then we're going to bring on another friend who's been both behind the camera and in front of the camera with us. So we, we start with you, Vandana. Go ahead. Hi, Jonathan. First Hello. of all, thank you so much for watching for 100, day, 100 straight days. That's amazing. Um, I mean, you comment, I've been seeing your comments, and you give us such a, an update on what's happening on the ground. Has What has been the most impactful day over the last 100 days? Uh, I, mean, it's quite... I think for me, um, it was how it really did the same thing as um, Katrina did in New Orleans. It ripped off the lid on what had been kept rather suppressed and not seen. Uh, in this case uh, of, uh, of Union Square things is how COVID sort of ripped off the lid and how much things like COVID, like um, uh, police brutality or state violence, if you will, affects uh, people of color in general and the African American uh, community in particular. But uh, it was quite an explosion. It's still going on. It's, the demonstrations aren't over yet. Uh, they, they're not always at Union Square anymore, but they're still there. Mm -hmm. And and when you look back over the last couple of days, like um, I mean, the last one hundred days, what, what which show has stood out to you and and i know we've been talking a lot about how um this pandemic has exactly like you said laid bare all of these inequalities and we and she was talking about this the other day how we're really looking at three different kinds of pandemics um i mean we're looking at, a, at three different kinds of crises we're looking at a pandemic uh, but, uh the protests that are happening over police brutality and, and an economic crisis we've tried to speak to that um, in our show, um, what has stood out, which, which episode has stood out to you? It's, um, I feel in a very strange way that I get 
more information and better information off of the COVID call to not necessarily get off of the regular newscasts because in here there is uh, more context. There is, um, in some cases, more depth or detail. Some of the details are quirky, which are fun. Some of them are quite uh, telling. Um, I'm not sure there's a true one or two standout moments. Uh, for me, it has been more of an overall sense uh, of people getting together, trying to talk to one another, find out what is going on, uh, analyze it, see what they can do. Uh, I think mm -hmm. I've said uh, to uh, three ones, perhaps a comment, I give shape to my days. All of a sudden, look forward to for those reasons. Mm -hmm. I have one last question. What This show has been, um, it's helped kind of anchor my days because I've had such unstructured um, days while of being in quarantine. What has this show meant to you as, as someone who's been watching for a hundred days? Yeah. Um, as I said, it's an anchor. It's a way of, of connecting with other people who are interested in the topic on a, a more serious level than just a news headline. Um, it is also, um, you know, as someone who is it's also like making certain that I am still connecting with people. Uh, I am by nature uh, an introvert, so it's important to remember to you know, get out of the house and talk to people, except I'm sheltering in place. I'm mm -hmm. a senior citizen, or rather like Sapphires. Yes, I'd like to go out and join a demonstration, but uh, not a good idea uh, when mm -hmm. you're in your seventh decade. So it, it has that sort of meaning to me. I sometimes refer to it as a Sri's coffee clutch because it has that degree of friendliness and intimacy and so, and so something to look forward to. Thank you for, no, thank you for sharing. I, um, yeah. So I just wanted to come in here and just first show, uh, first uh, show Jonathan's Twitter handle. It's thousand and three, Jonathan, one thousand and three. I presume that's your zip code, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is the Union Square zip code, oddly enough. Of course it is. And uh, and uh, tell us, well, uh, a writer, urban ecologist, and a flaneur. Well, no. Um, urban ecology reflects my interest in how cities uh, develop for good or for bad. Uh, and to be fair, in some cases, it's kind of neither. Uh, one of my hot interests right now um, really came out of uh, some uh, other groups of protests which are against gentrification, which has unfairly uh, targeted minority groups. And the question that I had was, was there really an analogy with what was happening there with, say, state violence and things of that nature? Uh, through a system known as forensic architecture. I, in fact, have a course in it. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, will it be a longer answer? Uh, when I can go out and do some more research, there may be. But uh, the way it is targeted destroys not only, in many cases, a viable minority neighborhood, but it also upsets the overall ecology of the environment. If you go back to Jane Jacobs, she discusses multi-use versus single-use neighborhoods. The more mm -hmm. multivalent or the more uses a neighborhood has, the more vibrant it has. But multi-use neighborhoods also tend to be uh, middle class, lower middle class, working class. And the third description, the third word you used to describe uh, it. Uh, well, that is, um, a fine a 19th century uh, term, which is having a little bit of a moment right now, oddly enough. There's even a book, How to Flaneur, uh, not written by me, I should add. Uh, a flaneur is essentially a kind of a person who does mindful or deliberate wanderings. It's sort of serendipity with a purpose. You're sort of letting things happen, but you're also looking for what is happening. So I sometimes refer to it as a boulevardier having an existential crisis. The existential crisis is you're defined by what you find. Okay. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for your, your being here and being uh, such a great supportive voice. We know on days where we may have 
no viewers. We'll have one viewer for sure, and people I think are. It was only the first show. <laughs> yeah. uh, if our first show might have been our only only person watching, and we have a look at Christine saying, "Admire Jonathan's loyalty, 100 shows, and uh, and Jonathan's artwork." Mark is asking about, but I, uh, Jonathan, stick around. We're going to bring another guest on in just a second, and we're just so grateful to you, Jonathan. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to bring Thank you. Uh, before we bring on our guest, I want to show everyone a fun way that we developed to have folks send in their greetings. And we're using a tool called Flipgrid to do that. And here's a greeting from someone who has made this show possible in ways that even Vandana may not quite know yet. So we're going to show this to her and to everybody. This is uh, a greeting from the founder of StreamYard. Uh, the oh. service that makes this possible. Here we go. Hey, Shri. Gage from Shreemar here. I just wanted to congratulate you on episode 100. It's been so amazing seeing you go live every single day and bringing people together during these uh, uncertain times. You've had so many amazing guests. And I can't wait to be on that uh, guest list in the future. And that's pretty wow. cool. <laughs> so let's do some more of these. Uh, let's look at a couple of more of these. And so he's the founder of StreamYard, folks. So it's hey, nice, Shri, uh, nice to have him here. Hey, Shri, I just wanted to say hello. This is Tim McDonald from Tampa, Florida. So great to have you on the Business of Speaking show with me earlier today, a very special day where you're celebrating your 100th episode. It's just been an amazing three plus months of watching you every day share and have amazing guests and to see those guest lists just grow and grow and grow. amazing people that you're having coming on your show. So congrats on 100 episodes. Hopefully we don't need to keep it going too long, but I know you will be there we do. <laughs> that was nice. Okay, let's see who else is here. This is Paula from- It's Paula from Big Green Pen. I just want to congratulate you on your 100th episode and thank you for bringing us all together. Uh, I'm trying to think of a favorite moment, but there are quite a few. It's definitely Sapphire's appearance and the time we spent recently talking about um, Nick Kristoff and Shira Wudan and their observations and the First Amendment. And I think, I know this sounds a little cheesy, but the fact that we built such a great community is, is as important as the phenomenal guests. I'm grateful to have had a small part behind the scenes once in a while and grateful to have seen how much work you put into this and into making it a consistent opportunity for people to be together. So congrats again on your 100th episode. Thank you. That's Paula. She's awesome. Let's see who else is watching. Oh, we Hi. saw this already. That was Mark. Mark uh, was our first person to send it in. Hi, this is Renee. And I want to say congratulations to Sri Srinivasan and Rose Horowitz and Vandana Menon for a hundred shows of COVID. May this two sh show pass. Thank you for keeping me sane and optimistic and happy. We love you. Actually, Sri, I wanted to ask you, which has been your favorite moment? Oh, wow, that's, uh, that's tough. Um, I've been trying to figure out you know, trying to think about there's so many that just all kind of blend together. Mm -hmm. One of the things about doing a daily program like this that I don't recommend to anybody, right? Like yeah. every single day, not even a weekend off or anything, only possible because of the support of the two of you in Rose and, and Vandana, but also everybody in the audience. So I'm not going to, and it's like you'd love all your children, all uh, uh, all 100 of our children. <laughs> I'm just very, uh, very grateful uh, to everybody for being here. Let's ask Rose if she has a favorite. I know she uh, got to produce uh, several that she, she joined the leaders, big stars. You talk about that, and then we're going to bring on our guest, Bob Anthony, who's been with us. He's actually a viewer and also a, a host sometimes mm -hmm. and a guest sometimes. It's been great. Go ahead, Rose. Uh, well, one of my favorite shows um, was we did a Connecticut under COVID. And uh, that was like, you know, sometimes people. <clears throat> um, tweet us or text us, hey, you know, can you have me on? And this was like, I just started from scratch and found people in the community who are leaders 
in, uh, and this was before uh, the death of uh, the murder of uh, George Floyd. So like two weeks before that, and we did a show about how uh, COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting uh, minorities and the underserved in Connecticut, but as a reflection of, of what's going on in the, in the country. So I was so proud that we did that. And um, <clears throat> I guess, of course, I, I'm especially uh, uh, pleased to get uh, Sapphire on the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was just so uh, eloquent and powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know her a little bit uh, prior to that. So, but she just, you know, was incredible. Uh, and of course, see, having Rupa and uh, Kelly, Kelly Hoey, and a shout out to my family and my husband who uh, helped uh, do a children's book author show, which was really a lot of fun. Yeah, that was that was one of our great best shows. We just laughed and laughed for. Uh, we had four awesome authors, and yeah. a big shout out to to your husband Alan for being with us as well. He was great. So let's bring on Bob Anthony. Have him say hi to us and uh, share some of his thoughts. Bob was on our third show, and then he's come back several, multiple times because he and Vandana have hosted with me a, a very popular segment called News You Missed. And the reason we started that was because Bob Anthony told me about some news I missed. Hi, Bob. Hey, Shri. Always good to <laughs> Hey, Vandana. Hi, Rohan. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here. Bob is one of my, uh, I was gonna say older, more um, seasoned friends uh, in New York, right, Bob? We go back a long way. He is uh, a Columbia man like me, but he went to Columbia undergrad. I went, I, I went to and studied and taught at Columbia Journalism School, but we know each other for 20 plus years. He's a former president of the uh, New York Society of Professional Journalists chapter known as the Deadline Club. He's also president of the New York Association of Black Journalists. But more importantly, he's a tech writer, uh, and he uh, is a veteran tech writer who has 1.2 million followers on Pinterest. So everyone should, uh, if you're on Pinterest, you want to follow him, but also on Twitter, everywhere, he's at New York Bob. Very easy to find. Bob, what do you think of today? I know you were watching at least some parts of it. Uh, I'm just impressed, first of all, that you managed to get through the 100 days. Like uh, it, That's just incredible, Shri. I really appreciate the community you brought together here and uh, the interesting guests. I always get the inside track on something, like the gentleman from the parks uh, department that you had on the other day. When you talked about his uh, whole SHIT moment, uh, when he uh, found out about Amy Cooper in the park, you know, you don't get that reading the paper. You have to talk to the person. And uh, uh, that was just eye-opening. So that, I appreciate that little bit of uh, uh, inside uh, inside uh, uh, look, but uh, 100 days was just astounding. And you you don't you don't know this because we haven't talked about the role you played in us switching. When we started, we were a conference call, an audio conference call for the first three episodes. And on the audio show, you decided to turn on your camera because we we're using a tool called Uber Conference that has a camera. And you started showing us tech tips and tools that we all should buy to help us survive the pandemic, the lockdown day three. And I said, this needs to be a video show. And that's why we switched starting that following day. We moved to video and here we are, 100 days of, of show. So thank you, Bob. Just one of the many uh, ways you've um, left an impression on me. I want to ask you, uh, Bob, about your work as a writer. And um, But we also want to talk about your father because he was uh, in the transit system here and you uh, uh, have rightly told us many times to look for the news about the transit workers and uh, also give you a chance to give him a shout out on, on Father's Day weekend as we go into that. I appreciate that, uh, Shri. You just, you just made me reach into the drawer for uh, this thing. Uh, it looks like a plain old wrench, but what it is is a uh, reverse key for the old subway trains. Uh, it doesn't work on the ones they run now, except for the R32s, which they're about to retire. So I keep this around as a reminder of my father's uh, work to, you know, uh, keep uh, three black boys alive, I guess, my mother too. And uh, uh, it's, you know, it, and just to keep, uh, keep the family together. So this is my little reminder here. So what is it again? It's a kind of key? 
it looks like a plain old wrench. In order mm -hmm. to get one of the old subway trains to go into reverse, you have to put this into the console and give it a hard yank, uh, which is on purpose because you don't want to uh, reverse a subway train by mistake. <laughs> so it's, it's a reverser key is what it is. It's very heavy. And uh, I found it the other day and uh, I just keep it handy. But, uh, but after uh, uh, 100 days uh, of this show, you've made me get a little nostalgic. So I started reaching for some of my ancient tech, like this, uh, this is my old uh, Sharp Zorus 1997 uh, edition, I guess. And I actually covered uh, the Consumer Electronics Show. I can figure out which way to roll. <laughs> I'll never figure it out. <laughs> I actually covered the Consumer Electronics Show with this thing. So this is a 1997 Sharp Zorus and it's still working. And still working. You, That's amazing. My, you made me remember my 1985 Radio Shack uh, Tandy, which is what I used at the old Milwaukee Sentinel. All of this kind of technology is coming into, I mean, technology is what's making it possible to catch these videos out in the street uh, to, uh, to change the news and to uh, 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 keep the conversation going. But just some examples of how we did, did it in the old days. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Look, uh, Apollo says, reverser key is cool, he says, uh, and, and that's that's nice. I want to get give Rose and Vandana also opportunity to jump in anytime, uh, ladies, as we're, as we're talking here to, to Bob. Uh, there's so many news items we missed, Bob. Have you had a chance to think of some of the things that we should have, if we were doing a news we missed, what would you want us to know? Uh, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I, was, I, I haven't caught up in the last few hours uh, <laughs> in, locally. It's, it, it's so, you know, so afraid I'm not being of much help at the moment, but I actually had been maintaining a list of uh, news that we had missed uh, for the other days of the week. Okay, so uh, Vandana, what was it like to work with Bob on those shows, the news you missed? And we should do one soon, I think. Uh, Vandana, did you, were you able to hear me? Yeah, so uh, what did you think about what we should do? We should do one soon. A, yeah. new, a news you missed show. What did I think about working? Yeah, on those news you missed episodes. Oh, yeah. it was so much fun and I got to learn so much. Um, actually, what I think I learned was that COVID actually frames everything, all the news that we have, that, that all the headlines are consuming. Um, but yeah, I would be ha I would love to do one again with you, Bob. That would be amazing. Uh, I just thought of something, and I mentioned it in a show that I taped yesterday. Uh, I also do a Media Watch show with my friend Eric Tate. It's his show. But I mentioned, you know how the Confederate statues have been coming down all over the place, correct? Yes. In Richmond, I was there in 2003 when they installed a new statue, Abraham Lincoln. Mm. They had to put Lincoln not in a main square they had to put him in a park behind a fence that they could close at 5 p.m uh that's a little background about the city of richmond and it's con you know it's in in it's confederate pride that they had to put the single statue that they have of abraham lincoln in richmond virginia in a city park behind a fence that could be locked at five uh i just you know it's a bit of a con yeah, just a bit of contrast in light of today's news Mm -hmm. I want to just tell everybody who, uh, you know, has, doesn't pay attention and they say, well, look at these statues are actually, you know, pride of 150 years ago. Many of these statues, most of the statues were made long after the Civil War was over, decades okay. after, some of them in the teens and 20s as part of white uh, nationalism and white supremacy uh, yielding, uh, you know, uh, wielding power. And that's what we saw. Uh, let's make sure we bring in some of the greetings. We have greetings from people all over the world. So let's look at this greeting. Hi, this is Achut Menon from Hyderabad, India. 100 days. Congratulations. Sri, Rose, and Vandana, and the team behind you. Rose and Vandana, and the team behind you. You've been an inspiration, touching so many lives. Amazing speakers, fantastic energy, keep up the great work, spread the love. Here's a shout out to my daughter, Vandana Molu, 
Amma and Achan are very proud of you. Drew also sends his love. Oh, look at that. That's, that's proud father. That's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea he was doing this. He cheated. <laughs> I love that. That was that was awesome, and he is. You can see see how proud he is. Let's see who else who else sent him. Sri, Rose, Vandana, and Neil, congratulations on 100 shows. You've been creating and keeping a community to, of us together, enlightening and informing us, and entertaining us. I don't want to say here's to another 100, but I am wishing you all the best. Thank you. That's Courtney Pulitzer, who many of you met before. She was a guest on our show. Hello, Shri. This is Joe Appio coming to you from Cumming, Georgia. This is in Forsyth County, Georgia, which is about 30 miles north of Atlanta, very close to Alpharetta and Roswell, Georgia. <coughs> That's my dog, Brownie, in the background. It's a beautiful night here. And Shri, I just have to say that you've been a lifeline. You've been fantastic during all of this. You've also been able to secure network talent on your show every night. I know it's you and your producers and your family that have been incredibly um, supportive, but I have to say this is unreal. What you've pulled off with limited resources is unheard of. You've really maybe changed the way that we're going to be looking at uh, broadcast. You really are a revolutionary. So, Hats off to you, my friend. Keep up the good work, and let's unify this country. Thank you. That's Joe Appio, everybody. Was that amazing? We already saw Renee's. Uh, let's see. It's great. Congratulations on your 100th episode. So exciting. I'm Dr. Marina Curran, and, uh, and you have been so kind to, as to invite me to some of the shows, and I've been super appreciative. I've learned. People have learned. I think it's been such an important and crucial part of our pandemic experience to be able to get great information and a reliable source. And certainly your background in journalism certainly does that. And the beauty of your background and interest in tech is that this has been made super easy by you and your team. And I want to thank all of them. Uh, and as many of your viewers know, we're also going to be doing uh, She's on Call. It is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day in advance to all of you guys. And um, we look forward to seeing you on Sunday as well. Thank you. And that is Dr. Marina Korean. That's we're very proud of our spin-off show, aren't we? Rose and Vandana are producing mm -hmm. that show. Uh, we'll show everyone the card from it. That is every Sunday. And this is the show that was last week. Uh, people can go back and watch it on at She's On Call. Uh, go ahead, Rose, tell us about the show and tell us about the name of the show as well. Okay. Uh, well, I just spoke to Marina and uh, Sujana uh, Suj today, uh, <laughs> a few hours ago, talking about the show. So um, the show. Well, we were looking for a name. We had uh, some ideas like woman doctors talking, uh, what's up doc, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, I kind of threw it out to my family. You know, more of us are here at this time. I, my, I have four kids and two, two are home from college. Uh, one, my daughter is a speech pathologist. She's been around and uh, we all kind of kicked it around after dinner. And uh, my husband, who's a, a writer, a comedy writer and children's book author, uh, came up came up and said she's on call and we were all searching we had I'd been we searched on uh, GoDaddy to see if it was available and we saw it was available and it was available on all platforms and the idea of the she's on call is that you know all doctors are on call but she's on call and and the, as Marina and uh, Sunu have told us you know many not only their family expecting to be on call all the time as women and as women doctors, but people they don't know. They go, you know, they'll go to a concert and somebody, the bass player said to Marina, well, can you look at my back? Uh, so uh, that's the idea. And we, we want to um, create a community where people can call in with, you know, can call in with questions like a, on your show. And we're, we're this weekend, we're having uh, Dr. Uh, Lee Lon, who's a um, a resident, and she wrote a piece in the Washington Post uh, about the danger of rubber bullets. And uh, we're also going to have um, Dr. Hernandez on, uh, and I think 
uh, she's an anesthesiologist and she's going to talk about what she does and how important mm -hmm. that has been during COVID-19. So when people say to you, what did you do during COVID-19? You'll say you, you made a daily show and then you'll say you made from scratch a weekly show for doctors, by doctors, for the audience of the world. And yeah. uh, you, you should be very proud, both Vandana and Rose. And uh, this is the this is all I want to go to our tech expert here, Bob Anthony at New York. Bob, uh, the technology that makes this all possible is pretty amazing. As you look at your career and what you covered, what what does that say about where we are and where this could go? That we could host this on a very cheap platform and tell and bring together a planet. I mean, I'm I'm very hopeful because I remember what it took to do something like this, uh, you know, before the turn of the century, as we say. Uh, you had to make arrangements with the phone company. You had to have the right video hookup. The audio was just a B-I-T-C-H to get right. Uh, I'm impressed at what people do with uh, simple cell phones and uh, uh, tablets. I, I had to remind myself of the name of the young lady who shot the George Floyd video, Donella Frazier. So how, how many times have you tried to teach students to keep the video steady? She's not the least bit trained in journalism, uh, video, but she kept video steady. And we caught the entire you know, incident in a way that uh, you look at a citizen video and you see so many shaky videos, but she caught it right. So that's what's coming. People are just getting <coughs> at it. That's Very great. exciting. I remember, um, Bob, I had a, a Radio Shack, you know, Tandy, I guess it was. And when I wanted to transmit a story to, to the paper I was working for, it would take like, we lived in LA at the time. My husband and I would go to go to lunch and come back and it was still going. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and you mean this one? Bro? Yes. Yes. Okay. So. That was it. And we, we were living in LA and I was freelancing for a New York paper. Yes. Uh, I'm not freelancing, I was staff, but I was a West Coast correspondent covering trade and transportation. And, you know, and I, I'd go to a conference in downtown LA, come back and type the story. And, and that, you know, and then it would take an hour <laughs> to transmit. And, you know, I, of course it wasn't a uh, wire, but, uh, and when I did, uh, did go to events um, that were, that it had to be live, like a F, um, Federal Reserve Board Chairman saying something, I would call it in. You know, so, and here we are. You know, look how around the world we're we're all on one platform. It's yes, like I, I I ate a lot of lunches and dinners while my story transmitted, so I know what you mean. We used to call it. I'm I'm just going to school the young one here in, <laughs> uh, in Rose. I mean, sorry, in uh, Rose also very young. But uh, tell her to tell Vandana that we used to call it the worldwide weight. And we would, uh, you would, you'd, you'd be, you'd have a magazine with you, and you'd read, and then you'd hit, you'd read something, you'd hit next, and then you'd read something here, and then it would change, and then you'd look over there, finish reading, and then come back. That was the second screen. Your first screen was a was a book or a magazine or a right. newspaper. That was how you got things done. Otherwise, if you just waited on the screen, you'd be just waiting like this <laughs> with to, to render. It was really uh, something, uh, something else. Um, we have a couple more videos we want to show, including from a show that I will never forget. And I want to say this uh, to everybody, you know, the um, it, a lot of television shows and others have kind of pivoted now to covering African-American issues and bringing on African-American guests. Uh, and one of the problems of American television is that they bring on, Bob, as you know, as, as an observer of media and, uh, and a journalist yourselves, they bring on African-Americans to talk about so-called African-American issues, right? Like that's when they have them. They, you don't see African-Americans often just talking about everyday things. And we're very proud that, you know, we didn't have Bob Anthony on our show, episode number three, uh, to just chat about what it's like to be African-American. We had him on to talk about technology. And we did that work for so many weeks and weeks and weeks that when the time came, when the world was on fire in America, we earned the right to have a show where we talked about, Af about um, being American with great African-American speakers, such as Sonny Slaughter and Keisha Center and Adam Server. That was a night I'd never forget. I cried through a lot of that show and I learned so much. Uh, but 
We also had Sapphire, the great poet, who's been mentioned so many times on the show today. She's mm -hmm. new to Twitter, folks. Everyone, please follow her. That can be one thing we uh, do. Um, uh, everyone can just go to uh, Twitter, and this is, I'm going to show everyone her Twitter handle so that you can follow her. She is uh, so awesome, and uh, she left such an impact. It's her movie, her, her book, Push, that became the movie Precious that won the Oscar and everything. She only has 49 followers, folks. You can, she's just getting started. You can follow her right now. Be uh, 50, 51, the 25th anniversary of Push is coming, so there's going to be a big push around all of that. So you're going to see her take off online as more people know she's online. She's and got, so she's got gonna, a trilogy coming up. That's right. So and uh, she's been on this show. She's been on my WBAI show. She's just an awesome uh, speaker. Uh, and you can see she's in lockdown. She's got the mask on, and she was just terrific. So everybody, please uh, follow her if you're on Twitter. Uh, let's look at. A couple of other uh, guests and, and people who have sent in videos. We're so grateful to them. And uh, let me go on here and go to our Flipgrid. So we're using this tool Flipgrid to bring in videos like this. And if anybody, teachers uh, know this. And this is uh, Sunny, and she's here with us. So let's uh, hear her message to us. Hi, Shri. Hi, team. I just wanted to drop in and wish you all congratulations on your 100th episode and having that episode happen on June T. Thank you for recognizing the importance of black lives, how they matter, why they matter, and why we must keep pressing on for the change that we seek. Shri, you have been amplifying the message, the voices, and those who are making a difference. I just wanna take this time to say personally to you from me, Thank you for all that you have done to make a difference in my life. Sending love, blessings, and great cheers on the 100th episode. Take care. Uh, she, she was just awesome. Um, I want to say uh, you all remember that episode and uh, how great she was. And Bob, one of the things she said is, don't ask your Black friend, what can you do now? Ask yourself, what have you been doing? And I, I'll never forget that. Even as I say it, I get, I get, um, you know, Bob, you and I have not talked about race in our 20 years together. We never had reason to at all about, talk about tech. Can you talk a little bit about your, how you're feeling at this moment with all that's going on in the world? Um, well, I, I guess it's a little bit of a hope, a little bit of a melancholy that it took this long to get here and it took an incident like that to get us here. So I, I'm just hoping that we actually do something with this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to say something a little, not terribly PC, but when I saw the marchers uh, coming through Brooklyn the other day, I noticed a lot of them were white and a lot of them were young, and they were shouting Black Lives Matter, and that was very encouraging, and it, I took that to my heart. But a, a dark side of me looked at it and said, wow, it looked like the doors that Google opened up and everybody walked out. And it, because you, know, you still have companies like that, like Facebook in high tech, which in which the African American percentage of workers is in the single digits. So I, I'm hoping that uh, this is real. I'm hoping that change will come of it. People will actually vote. People will actually do the census. And you know, I'm very hopeful, but I'm old enough to be uh, a little jaded, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for being here. Thank you for being a friend and uh, for helping me in so many ways. And now you're helping us through this. Uh, we have several more videos we need to show. Thank you all for sticking through now the second. We're going into our third hour here. Uh, you know, let's let's look at some of these videos. They've all been so kind to share them. And here is Rahadian. Good evening, everyone. From Center Reach, Long Island, New York, about 60 miles east of New York City. My name is Rahajan Sastordayo, and I'd like to say congratulations to Sri and to all of his team on 100 days of this very valuable daily show. I have to say that I learn a lot whenever I'm able to attend. And I also say that this show and the um, interviews give me a lot of hope for the future at a time where it seems that, you know, things are dire. We're still in the middle of this pandemic. But I think that as long as we you know, stay on course and do our best to keep ourselves, our loved ones, and each other safe, 
that we'll, we'll get on the other side of this. So I'm very appreciative and thank you very much. Have a great night, everyone. That was Radian who has been commenting so much on our post. Congrats. Congrats on 100 <laughs> episodes. That is so amazing. We have enjoyed so many of these episodes with incredible information and even better conversation. Thank you so much for everything you guys do. Can't wait to see the next 100, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my cousin, Fatna, my sister. I'm so grateful to her out in LA with her wonderful son, Cyrus. And she's a filmmaker uh, in here. Hello, Shrey. Good afternoon to you and everyone listening in, entire community. I want to first say happy Juneteenth to everyone and happy Father's Day to you and your entire community of fathers. I also wanted to say that I love you. And one of the things I admire most about you is that you're an open connector you're willing to share your information and your knowledge with everyone, and that makes me really happy. I'm really happy about it. I want to say congratulations to you and your entire team on this achievement of 100 consecutive shows. And I don't know how many more you have, but I don't want to see it stop. I don't expect you guys to continue every single day after COVID-19, after we reopen, but I hope you will do it at least once a week moving forward. I would appreciate it and i think the entire community really enjoy listening to you and seeing these shows uh, oh that's that's awesome so uh not to give uh vandana and rose a heart attack but every time they hear 100 shows or keep going every day i know they they die a little bit inside <laughs> <laughs> uh, my husband says i'm on the phone all the time i said well that's my job <laughs> 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 but then I, I hope you get freed from this uh, yeah, from, from this and that you don't have to do another 100 episodes. <laughs> uh, I wanted to just say, speaking to what Bob said earlier, there's this great uh, Zora Neale Hurston quote, um, there are some years that ask a question and there are some years that answer. And I've been thinking about whether 2020 is the year that's asking the question or whether it's been answering it. And I think I think this year has been answering a lot of um, open questions. I think for the first time, everyone is kind of um, on the same page, hopefully. Yeah. I don't know. That's really something that we're, we're thinking about. Uh, you know, I, uh, Bob has known me for a long time. The others are newer in my life, but I would say I never quote Vladimir Lenin, but he said something that I, I'll never forget. I learned on one of these episodes uh, where uh, the quote is that there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. And right. this is from like there have been decades every day. You can't look at the newspaper, like, you know, the headline, every one of these headlines would have been like six columns across on some days if, if there wasn't so much other stuff happening uh, all at the same time. And that's where we are. Let's look at some more of these videos. By the way, look at how Daryl understood the system so well, he was able to put in his handle and put a link to his Twitter. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So this is new technology and then knowing what to do with new technology. And you saw Daryl there. And here's Iman. Hi, Sri. This is Iman Ali. Um, I'm at Iman MSW. I am recording this from the loop. Uh, you can't really see it, but the Chicago River is in the background. Congrats on everything. Looking forward to the next hundred. Uh, or not, <laughs> we don't want to stay quarantined for this much longer. But thanks for everything you do. Thanks for everything you've taught me. And I'm honored to call you a mentor and a friend. Oh, that's so nice. And so Iman was watching. She's she's with JAMA, you know, the, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. And she was watching our show yesterday, which was like a life highlight, right? To have uh, the chief scientist of the WHO and the, at the her title is director of pandemic response yeah. at the, at the, and the first uh, ever the, scientist scientist the very mm -hmm. first and a woman yeah yeah, yeah. And we are very proud of proud of uh, earning that and bob you know from their journalism and as does rose uh you earn your interviews right you don't just walk in and be able to do it if you're with a big brand of course you can but we had no brand we had nothing and then we earned it along the way people at the who watching our shows and then saying, okay, we'll come on. You know, that takes energy, takes time, takes an audience to keep us going. And you all did that for us. 
So thank you. Please go and watch episode 99. Hey, Sri. From my compact, though thriving South Philly herb garden. Congrats on your wonderful yeah. Thanks for being there for us and providing what has been a real lifeline. I'm not the one who came up with that, but I definitely have felt that to be the case too about your amazing show. That's Steve, that's Steve Taylor, who's on our team and does amazing journalism and uh, uh, social and digital media. Steve DeReeve, everybody, please follow him. He's terrific. I am amazed at what Sri has accomplished. 100 shows every single day during this completely unexpected lockdown, at least unexpected for most of us. I've learned firsthand from people on the ground in Italy and Asia and throughout the world. I've heard from different perspectives. Most importantly, we've got a community here that is so valuable. I've met people that I hope I'm going to stay in touch with long after we forget this whole period, which who knows when that'll be. At any rate, Sri, thank you so much for putting so much energy into this and bringing us all together and making this whole strange situation just a bit better for us all. I'd love to know how you do it every day, but thank you. We do it because of these wonderful producers, the audience, the sponsors, all of them make it possible, my family. And Doug Levy, everyone, follow at SF Doug. He has a daily newsletter, three headlines that you have to know about coronavirus. And within two or three weeks of the virus, he had already written a book on how to communicate during the virus. So SF Doug and at DougLevy.com. Ask him for it, Doug at DougLevy.com. Hey, Sri and the whole team, I want to say congratulations on 100 shows. I certainly haven't watched even close to that many, but I am awed by everything I see and awed by just how much you produce and all of it is really good. And the thing I want to ask you guys is now that you're 100 shows deep, you've talked to so many people, you've explored some major issues right now from so many angles. What is the thing you've learned most about America by having all these conversations and what, if anything, gives you hope? Wow. All right, here's to 100 more, or maybe this will end and you won't need to do them. <laughs> That's Bill Carbone, a friend, uh, and also I'll tell you a little bit about our collaboration, but Rose, do you want to uh, tell us, and, and Bob also, I'd love to hear all three of you that answer, not just from the show, but what have you learned about America and what gives you hope? Rose, you want to start us off? Okay. Um, I guess the diversity of voices that we've been able to hear, um, not only in America, but I guess worldwide, and uh, that despite all the trouble and pain that we're in, that people are finding ways to connect. And, uh, you know, if we had any small part in anybody's feeling of connection and, and knowing what's going on on the ground, I think, you know, I'm very proud of that. Great. Uh, let's let's go to Vandana. Um, yeah, I'm not American. I didn't grow up here. I've only been here for a year or two. And um, I think what I've learned the most about America over the last few months is, um, like Rose said, there's just incredible diversity. And also, um, it's possible for so many different kinds of people to come together. And I think um, the last few weeks have really proved that. And um, I'm not, I'm hope, it gives me hope that something similar can happen in India um, down the line. Uh, I hope communities can come together in the same way that um, communities have come together here and showed up for each other, I think. Bob, your thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm learning as I go, even at this advanced age. And uh, it, it's good that at least people are talking. A lot of people, most of us are talking in, in, and not shouting at each other. Uh, we're, we're trying to learn from each other. Uh, I thought I had seen poverty in uh, New York City growing up. But when I was in Wisconsin, I visited a, a farm. Some kid had lost a field or something. They found the kid. But I visited the farmhouse. Poorest structure I'd ever seen in my life. 
had never met uh, poor farmers, never seen people live like that. It reminded me that there are so many different types of people and ways to live in this country that I don't know about. And at least we're talking today, uh, all of us that make this American soup uh, work, uh, at least we're talking. Thank you. Uh, this is just great to see all these comments coming in and people uh, speaking and sharing. I'm just so moved by all of this. I wanted to say uh, that uh, I am very, very touched by everyone's response to everything we've been doing. We still have a couple more videos. Bob, if you're going to hang in there, we'd appreciate it. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let's go in here and let's look at another video. Shri, congratulations on your 100th Shri COVID-19 call. Uh, I can't believe that uh, we're here 100 days later. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that when you first started do doing these calls, when you said you were going to do them daily, I thought you were a little crazy. I thought you were nuts. But the most important thing uh, is that you know not only these have been very um, critical calls and shared some really great information, but you made that incredible pivot today on June 9th, Juneteenth. Um, over the last two, three weeks, you've focused the conversation on racial justice, on uh, equity, on, on the challenges in our system. Uh, so thank you for doing that. And in your honor, I added the hashtag to the top corner. I added a StreamYard logo and a couple of emojis. I know you like to play with filters and, and trick out your videos. So again, congratulations and uh, here's to many more. Great working with you. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, from from Neil Parekh, uh, who uh, you all know is our uh, producer on the New York Times Read Along. And this Sunday, we have the print editor of the New York Times, 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Everybody, please join us. It's going to be an amazing day. Tom Jolly will be here. And we, Neil and I, drove to his house, sat at his breakfast table last August, and read the New York Times. I couldn't have been happier. Uh, that to read the New York Times with the man who decides, among many other people, what goes into the New York Times. Ask him to questions. Please join us Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. We are, we'll be so grateful to have you with us uh, for that ride. Uh, we have just a few more. Let's keep going here. Let's see who's, who's next. And thank you, Neil, for all you do uh, with us in helping tell the stories and connect people. Congratulations, Shri and team, on your 100th episode tonight. Thank you for 100 days of critically important conversations. I look forward to much more valuable content from you in the days ahead. And that's Jenny Lazarus, who is on our team as well. We're so proud of the DigiMentors team. Everybody, please check out what we do and please be in touch with us. Congratulations. Oops, sorry. Hi, Shri, it's Therese, and I just want to congratulate you and the entire Shri team on your 100th Global Show. I feel so honored to be part of the Global Shri community and all you do to pull us together through thought-provoking programming that is both informative and incredibly welcoming. Thank you, Shri. Therese has been a great supporter of everything we do. And we're very grateful to her. Uh, and she brought us the Justice Aid guests uh, tonight. Hi, Sri, and to all your viewers around the world, I'm Lori, and I'll be watching tonight from Rhode Island. I was thrilled, thrilled to be guest on your show number 97 earlier this week. It was definitely a highlight of a lifetime. And my message to you is that although I'm looking forward to hearing that you are safe and that you and your family can emerge outdoors um, after the pandemic in New York City, I do hope though that you will continue to stay on the air daily and record this show because I know that I have learned so much from you and from all of your guests. So best wishes, congratulations to you and to your producers. And I look forward to a hundred more shows uh, from you. Thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. That was uh, Lawrence, uh, Lori White Tarakani. And Lori uh, is the sponsor of the Tarakani Lectures on the First Amendment. And this week they launched with me interviewing the great Cheryl Wood Dunn and Nick Kristoff together. And they were with us. And then 
we watched it all live and then we replayed that in the interview and Lori's husband, Jim Tarakani, died a year ago and uh, she shared his crusading work fighting for the First Amendment. It was a very special evening uh, for me to spend uh, that time uh, at the University of Rhode Island and then to spend time with Lori and all of you telling the story of Jim Tarakani. Everybody, please go back and look at episode number 97 as well. Okay, let's keep going here. Who else is uh, joining us? Here we are, 100 days into this global pandemic, 100 days into lockdown, and 100 days of incredible learning and insight through Sri's COVID-19 calls. I have to tell you, it is absolutely mind boggling how you have done this for 100 straight calls. It is an incredible journey filled with insight and you have uplifted all of us. You have inspired all of us in so many ways. And once again, through our Digi Mentors group and our NYT Read Along family and many other ventures, we are showing the world how social good can be done and how social media can be done right. So you inspired me and many others. And with my 12th show tomorrow for my Spin It Social Hour, I am proud to celebrate Pride Week and support my photo community. That's great. And that's Stefan Kaplan, who's on our team. Uh, everybody, please check out the Spin It Social Hour. Please follow him on Twitter, at Spin It Social. And Rose and Vandana, you know Stefan very well, too. Great supporter. Great supporter. He, he'll he retweet anything, you know, when because he, he knows it's coming from us and uh, he's he's really terrific. And the show is amazing. You have to see it tomorrow. It was featured uh, this uh, week in uh, New York. What's a uh, New York talk? Today, the New York Times, uh, New York Today. And he doesn't know this, but uh, I worked on the launch of New York Today as a faculty intern in 1997 when I used to write a lot for the New York Times. I have more than 50 bylines there. We uh, I, I, I created a program working with our friend Kevin McKenna, who has watched the show many times. And he had us, he, he created a faculty internship where they brought a faculty member, me, into the New York Times to work on a product called New York Today, which was looking at like kind of hyper local stuff. It was uh, an adventure of a lifetime to be in the New York Times. We were not in the main building, Bob. We were in the annex where the digital stuff, so all the digital people were kept away. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we were not in that famous New York Times building. We were in Times Square, but we were one block over. And so I, I got to go and sit in on a real page one meeting and all of that. I was a young professor in 1997, a lifetime ago in every way. Let's keep going here. Uh, let's see who else is here. Hi, Sri. Congratulations on your 100th COVID call. I think it's just really great how it started out to be a call, has ended up as live stream video. And I think that that really shows something about you and about how you turn so much into a learning opportunity. COVID call has been a really terrific learning experience and you've had great guests and I love the response. And I don't want COVID to keep going. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody should have said something. Going. Sorry, I was not showing the video. Sorry, folks. Let me go back. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, this is uh, Linda Bernstein on our team. COVID sorry about that. I think it's just really great how it started out to be a call, has ended up as live stream video. And I think that it really shows something about you and about how you turn so much into a learning opportunity. COVID call has been a really terrific learning experience and you've had great guests and I love the response. And I don't want COVID to keep going, but I want you to keep going at everything you do. And thank you so much. And that's Linda Bernstein at Word Whacker. She's one of our, our, our dear colleagues who helped make our stories possible. And she's just done such an amazing job with us. Uh, she is executive produced Social Media Weekend, which we had to pivot from an in-person event to an online event in 10 days. And she uh, had the faith that we could do it. And we did, and we delivered a fantastic conference. 
uh, according to other people, not just me. Here are all the people who turned in their videos today. I'm so grateful. Keep sending them in, folks. We will. Uh, we would love to showcase them. Just go to flipgrid.com slash show. flipgrid.com slash show. And with that, we're now two and a half hours into this. This is an epic, uh, epic day. Um, I am just going to um, uh, say to Vandana and to Bob, we'll come back to Rose in just a second. Uh, just the thank you for everything. Bob, I'll give you a chance to give us your final thoughts. Well, thanks again, Sri, for making me part of this uh, this community that, you, that you've developed here. It's uh, it's been incredible. But like I keep telling you, I feel like I, I feel like the fan who walks into the locker room full of all stars. Uh, I, you you connected me with so many other interesting people. But in this era where journalism is so important, I've promised myself to do something over the weekend. I managed to get paid for a couple of different things. I'm going to renew my memberships in the Society of Professional Journalists, in the Deadline Club, in the, in the New York Association of Black Journalists when it uh, expires in a few days, the National Association of Black Journalists, and as a tip of, my, tip of the hat to my father, I'll rejoin the New York City Transit Museum. So congrats on a hundred shows. I'm so touched and so grateful to you, Bob. And uh, I, I'm uh, delighted. I, I know that you're going to send in a greeting to your father for our very special Father's Day tribute that we're doing. Um, everybody just go to digimentors.link slash Father's Day a father figure in your life, a grandfather, uncle, male role model, anyone with us or not with us anymore, please reach out and uh, do this, digimentors.link slash Father's Day. We'd love to showcase your father or someone like who's a father figure in your life. Just email me if you're confused about this or you don't understand. That's me with my dad and that's Neil Parikh with his dad, Prakash Parikh, who I knew much better than I knew Neil and then I got to meet him. Uh, he, he was at my wedding, but some of you know Indian weddings are a little crazy. And uh, he, he was forced to go to my wedding by uh, his father. And he came by and said, uh, Sri, I'm Neil Parik," and said hello from uh, his dad, Prakash, and he moved on. And now, 20 plus years later, we're friends and we're working together. So it's awesome. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you the question. Uh, what would you like to share with us as we say goodbye to you? Oh, good question. Um, I think that we will get all through. The, we will get through the pandemic. Um, we will survive it. Uh, also, that I hope it is a catalyst for change and change for the good. Thank you. I hope so too. And thank you for watching. I want Vandana and uh, Rose to also thank you for watching for a hundred state days. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for being there, even, there, even on days when on the on I wasn't there for a few days. <laughs> I took two days off. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jonathan. Your comments are always really wonderful, and your your um under your the depth of your watching and and learning and being part of this is really tremendous. So thank you so much. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy Jonathan got his moment in the sun. He's been so supportive. It's great to have him in front of the camera so we can see who he is and the cool person that he is. Uh, urban the hat. <laughs> eco ecologist, urban ecology, did you say? Yeah, that, urban ecologist, yeah. It's plain interesting. Yeah, and, and also he and I have a date to go to the Nutella Cafe in Union Square. We hope it's still there after it all opens up, but I can't wait to go and uh, uh, you, you, I've not had, had Nutella for three months, that it means I have withdrawal symptoms and I might eat the whole cafe if I'm not careful. So uh, Jonathan, you'll have to keep me uh, away from too much Nutella when we do that. Thank you, sir, uh, for being here. And thank you, Bob, I'll let you both uh, go or you can stay if you'd like to, you know, we have to read the name, we have to say their names, Bob, if you'd like to stay. And Jonathan also, uh, we, we'll, we'll allow, We'll uh, love to have you uh, do that with us in just a minute. Uh, before we go, we're going to read the names, uh, as we've been asked to say by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who was a guest on my WBAI show. Bob was on my very first WBAI show. I was very honored that he was there. Uh, Vandana, final thought before we go to reading their names? I, I just can't believe we're here at 100 days. Thank you to everyone for watching. Thank you, Shri, for doing this every single day. Um, 
and it's been incredible to meet and learn from so many amazing people and i hope we get to keep doing this thank you uh just so touched by everybody's uh appreciation tonight and uh their interest in the show and the momentum i think we've been able to build by really doing the work uh of finding great guests and great content uh and sri thank you for bringing us on this ride i've met so many great people uh from so many different places and different walks of life uh and uh many women to follow of course <laughs> uh and uh I just uh, thank everybody and hope uh, you keep watching us, whatever we we uh, whatever direction we go. We, we we've been changing and pivoting, so thank you. Thank you. And roses with hashtag women to follow. Everybody follow that and nominate women to follow for her to write about and uh, to take to the next level. So please do. And now we're going to do, which is uh, something that has been very meaningful, not just to me but to everyone who's watched. We're going to say their names, and I'm going to enlist. Are each of our uh, folks to join me as we say their names. So um, I just saw something walk around on the floor here, and so I, 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 I turned around. But let's go now and ask um, everybody to join us. And I'm going to first show you this uh, incredible cover of Time magazine. And what you're seeing there is Titus Kaffer's painting that was done. We're just going to watch it for just one second. And that is a young George Floyd with his mother, Larsenia Floyd. And he was, he was very young at the time, as you can see. And then he would die two years to the day almost since she died and then was buried next to her. And we're now going to say their names. And um, I'm going to ask Bob Anthony to start us off, uh, read about four or five names as comfortable as you are, and then we'll ask uh, Jonathan, and then Bandana, and then Rose. Uh, thank you, Shri. Trayvon Martin, Yvette Smith, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald. Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Jareem Reed. Natasha McKenna, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, William Chapman, Sandra Bland. Jonathan? Darius Stewart, Samuel DuBose, Janet Wilson, Callan Rockmore, Alton Sterling, Philandro Castile, Joseph Mann, Terence Crutcher. Chad Robinson, Chad Robinson, Jordan Edwards, Aaron Bailey, Stephen Clark, Danny Ray, Thomas Antoine Rose. Botham Jean, Atatiana Jefferson, Michael Dean, Ahmad Arbery, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd. And onto those names, you can add Rayshard Brooks, who was murdered less than a week, about a week ago. And, and Oluwatoi and Salo. And, and so many other names that, that keep going back in history. Um, I, want to, uh, I, I want to read you another name that uh, uh, Rehadian um, said to us. Uh, Bob, tell us the importance of us reading these names and saying those names and saying, why are people doing that now? Because it wasn't always done. Uh, we would hear about the name of the, we would hear about the incident, but the names uh, would get forgotten. And especially the people, not just, relative to the incident, the humanity of the individuals would get lost in the conversation. So we're doing a better job of fleshing out who the people were, they were family, you know, what families they were related to. We, we, we just, we need to know that each and every one of those names were real people with real families. And that's really important. Uh, Rahadian, who you met earlier, says, inciting the many, many black people who were killed over the past several decades, you often cite Emmett Till, there is also George Stinney Jr., 1929 to 1944, who was convicted of murdering two young white girls in his hometown of Alcolu, South Carolina, and sentenced to die via electric chair. He was and still is 
the youngest person ever executed in that manner. His conviction was later vacated in, in 2014. He was killed in 20, 1994. And um, on the grounds that Stinney had not received a fair trial. Thank you very much and please keep doing what you're doing. Not only is your show, is your work enlightening many, including me, it is giving hope that a dystopic, dystopic future is not an inevitable one. So with that, we will leave you all just to say thank you to all of you for being here, for being part of this family, this in incredible community, people around the world that are still watching almost three hours into the show. I am so honored to be part of this family and this community. I'm so grateful to everybody here. And looking at all these comments, here's Apollo saying, we appreciate you all. And uh, uh, here is uh, Mark saying, you folks are amazing. Glad to call five of you as friends of mine. Thank you, Mark. And uh, so many comments coming, still coming in. And Amber's still here. She was our guest and she's still here. This is so important. We must know their names and we have to read their stories. We have to remember these people gives dimensions to their characters, which also gets murdered to justify the cops' injustice. And with that, I, I will say goodbye to everybody and uh, just uh, say uh, we need to support our sponsors who, uh, who help us do all this. So a quick shout out to globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org and the team there that makes this possible. We're very grateful that they would uh, uh, give us an ad here, 20% off with the code SRI, globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org. It's a virtual teen camp that starts in July. Please tell your friends with teenagers that you uh, that they should check this out. Also, artandco.net. Get involved with the world's largest online art auction, fundraising for COVID-19 victims, artandco.net. And we're also grateful to Muckrack for the Fundamentals of Social Media course. It's already live. It's not coming June 17th. It's already live. And you can get a free certification, mrac.co slash social. 4,000 people are, have taken the course, have signed up for it, mrac.co slash social. And also a shout out to our new show that's coming on Sunday. The, this is actually not the new episode. The new episode is right here. And it is called She's on Call with Dr. Sujana and Dr. Marina. And our guests are Dr. Nadia Hernandez and, and Dr. Lilo. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Uh, we are so grateful to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Please email me if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, speakers. Uh, we have a fabulous guest tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be joined by Jacqueline Dolly, who will be here 9 p.m. Saturday. It's already almost <laughs> Saturday morning here now. But we're very grateful to everyone who's still here, who still stuck it out and watched. And Steve says he's proud to be part of this family. Radhyan sends his love. And uh, he says, I think he broke a record tonight, two hours and 45 minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. Rest well tonight. And Makran Boot has been very supportive and we appreciate it. He's giving a shout out to the historical Great Hudson River Revival Virtual Festival and uh, Father's Day weekend full of music and stories. Everybody check that out. Uh, that sounds great. And we will leave you all by just saying thank you to everyone for being here. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Everybody wave. Thank you.